Welcome to the 104th meeting of the National Advisory Council for Nursing Research. We're continuing with virtual meetings this round, as you can tell. Uh, and I do want to, before we begin, thank our retiring council members, Drs. Conley, M. Fletcher, Moore, and Wilbur. Thank you so much for your service. With that, let's jump right in and go over a few logistics for the day. This virtual only meeting is being broadcast live and will be archived via videocast. This is a one day meeting only. Closed session begins at 3.30 p.m. Eastern. A separate meeting invite was sent to the council members and all applicable staff with login instructions for the closed session. Uh, in terms of absences, there are no known. And I'll turn it over to uh, Dr. Susan Old to go over council procedures and related matters. Thank you, Dr. Zank. I want to welcome all of you, the council members, uh, and all of, the, all of those that are joining virtually with us today. We appreciate the council members sharing their expertise with NINR. And thank you so much for your continued support of the Institute. I do want to remind you to keep your uh, computer muted while we are on video cast. The meeting is being archived, so uh, we would very much appreciate you keeping down the background noise. I want to remind you that as special government employees, Council members may not engage in any lobbying activities while receiving pay from the federal government. Further information regarding conflict of interest and confidentiality requirements are posted on the electronic council book. So please review them if you haven't done so already. I will be speaking um, more specific instructions about conflict of interest and confidentiality during the closed session later this afternoon. On the electronic council book, we have put the meeting minutes from our January meeting. I hope that you have all had a chance to take a look at them. I would like to ask for a motion to approve those minutes. Do I have a motion? I move, I move to approve. To approve. <laughs> a second, please. I'll second. <laughs> uh, all in favor, just say aye. 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 Any aye. opposed? Uh, say nay, so I can hear. Terrific. All right, so the meeting uh, minutes from January are approved. The dates for um, future council meetings are listed in the electronic council book and also on our website. Please review them and let me know if you have any conflicts with any of those dates. Our next meeting is scheduled for September 14th and it again will be virtual. Uh, NIH has not decided when we will go back to in-person meetings. So if there's no questions for me, I'll hand it back over to Shannon uh, to continue with our presentations for the day. Thanks, Susan. Um, I'm going to share my screen. OK, I assume someone will let me know if that doesn't look quite right. Okay. Looks good. Excellent. Well, good morning, everyone. Again, um, thanks for joining us today virtually. And I'm glad to say that the day is certainly getting closer when we can hopefully have these meetings in person again. I want to give you a brief update on some of the activities here at NIH and NINR uh, since we last met in January. So to start again, I want to thank um, our council members uh, who are today as their last meeting with us, Drs. Conley, Fletcher, M. Moore, and Wilbur. So I want to thank you all for your service to NINR. Um, as I said, their terms on council are coming to a close, sadly, as of this May meeting. And certainly NINR and NIH are very appreciative of your time and efforts over these past few years. So thank you. So moving on to NIH news. 
Well, I know we uh, will be learning more details about NIH's UNITE initiative in our next presentation this morning. I did want to mention it as part of NIH news since we last met. Last year reminded all of us that systemic racism has plagued our country for far too long. Sadly, the research community is not immune from these issues and far from it. UNITE initiative announced by Dr. Collins earlier this spring was established to identify and address structural racism within NIH supported and the greater scientific community. UNITE uh, initiative, um, as I said, was announced by Dr. Collins and in his statement as he uh, did the announcement, he said, and I quote, as a science agency, we know that bringing diverse perspectives, backgrounds, and skill sets to complex scientific problems enhances scientific productivity, end quote. And I certainly couldn't agree more. Um, a diverse scientific workforce improves the quality of research, increases the likelihood that health disparity populations participate in and benefit from research, and contributes to robust learning environments. At NINR, we fully support this effort. I'm glad to represent NINR on the N Committee of UNITE, which you'll learn more about, and our NINR colleague, Sean Lewis, represents NINR on the I Committee. As part of UNITE, an NIH Common Fund effort has recently been launched to support transformative health disparities research. Two RFAs were released on March 26th to support research to develop, disseminate, or implement innovative interventions that prevent, reduce, or eliminate health disparities. I'm delighted to say that I've been asked to co-chair this program, along with colleagues in the Office of Research on Women's Health, the Tribal Health Research Office, and the National Institute on Minority Health and Health Disparities. In addition, we've begun planning for a potential complementary 10-year effort on health disparities to launch in fiscal year 2023. Another health disparities funding opportunity of note, an RFA was very recently published on understanding and addressing structural racism and discrimination. NINR is enthusiastically supporting this RFA, so do check it out. Applications are due later this summer with a deadline of August 24th. The National Institutes of Health, uh, Helping to End Addiction Long-Term or HELP Initiative, um, has launched an idea exchange, Moving Heal Research into Action to Gather Public Input. Ideas from diverse stakeholders will shape future directions for the initiative and the way research results are shared with uh, communities. The idea exchange aims to crowdsource solutions to improve pain management and the prevention and treatment of opioid misuse and addiction. All are invited to participate, including the many individuals on the front lines of the opioid crises. For example, treatment providers, advocates and families, law enforcement professionals, first responders, policymakers, and government health officials. The comment period is open until June 1st, 2021. In other funding news, the Support for Research Excellence, or SURE program, FOAs are now available. The SURE program has replaced uh, the SCORE program, which was the Support of Competitive Research program. The SURE program, so this new program, supports research capacity building at institutions that enroll significant numbers of students from backgrounds nationally underrepresented in biomedical research, award baccalaureate and or graduate degrees in biomedical sciences, and receive limited NIH research project grant funding. It seeks to develop and sustain research excellence of faculty investigators and provide students with research opportunities while catalyzing institutional research culture and enriching the research environment. Two SURE R16 funding opportunity announcements have been published to support investigator-initiated research projects. A SURE research resource center will enable broader participation in the SURE program nationally 
thus maximizing the program's impact and developing and sustaining research excellence at eligible institutions. Now, some notes uh, about NINR. At uh, the end of last year, Congress passed a full year omnibus spending bill, which funds us through September 30th, 2021. For fiscal year 21, we received just under $175 million, which was a small increase over last year, uh, which was also true for NIH. Please note that this number is a little deceiving. In fiscal year 20, uh, additional money was transferred to NINR for AIDS research that is not reflected in this table. Um, so when we uh, do account for the additional uh, fiscal year 20 funding, the actual funding increase we received in fiscal year 21 um, was about 1.5%. Please note that last year, NIH as a whole received a large amount of supplemental funding related to COVID that's not reflected in this table. On April 9th of this year, President Biden released a high level overview of his fiscal year 2022 budget request to Congress. This was the so-called skinny budget uh, that highlights overall funding levels for federal agencies and provides broad details on some of the president's priorities. The full president's budget will be released on Thursday, May 27. In the budget overview, the president requests $51 billion for NIH, which is up from $42.9 billion in fiscal year 21. Of that amount, $6.5 billion is requested to launch the Advanced Research Projects Agency for Health ARPA-H, a new project that's intended to be modeled after the Department of Defense's Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, or DARPA. Its initial focus will be on cancer and other diseases like diabetes and Alzheimer's disease. Funding requests for the individual NIH institutes and centers were not provided in the skinny budget. These will be released in the full budget. And always keep in mind that these are funding requests. Congress determines the final appropriation levels. At our last meeting in January, the Pathways Working Group presented their report, and I'd like to give you an update on our implementation of the report's recommendations. These efforts encompass short, intermediate, and long-term activities and planning. So with respect to the short term, there are some steps NINR has already been able to take to follow up on the recommendations of the Pathways panel. First, as the Pathways group noted, there are significant economic pressures on graduate students and postdocs. Beginning in March, students supported by NRSA fellowship awards, so F31 and F32 awards, can apply for up to $2,500 per year to defray childcare costs, and there are plans to extend this to trainees supported on T32s in 2022. In addition, NINR has taken um, immediate steps to diversify the reviewer pool, encouraging K awardees and applicants to apply for NIH's Early Career Reviewer Program. One of our K awardees has already been selected by CSR for this program, so good news. NRNR is also taking steps to promote our training opportunities, including diversity supplements in many venues, and my staff and I have been presenting to student groups and trainees. Some of the intermediate term plans based on the recommendations are activities that will happen later in 2021. For example, NINR is planning to host a grantsmanship and career guidance meeting for K awardees. In 2019, in conjunction with NIAD, NINR hosted such an event that was really well attended and extremely popular with our K awardees. In addition, we're in discussions with the National Institute on Minority Health and Health Disparities um, about their um, their program, um, which is, I'm not gonna get all the details right here, uh, Clinical Research Education and Career Development Program, which is an R25. Um, so this um, program provides grants to minority serving institutions 
to support educational and research activities designed to enhance the diversity of the biomedical, behavioral, and clinical research workforce. Other projects for this year include seeking out collaborative training opportunities by partnering with other T32s awarded by other institutes and centers at NIH to support training of nurse scientists and looking for ways to feature our talented nurse scientist trainees and their role models uh, through our website and social media. We're also working on longer term projects as we look forward to offering an increasing number of NINR supported training programs in coming years. NINR has hosted many well attended intensive training programs over the years, such as the Summer Genetics Institute and the annual methods boot camps. We're now looking at the possibility of creating similar intensive methods training aimed specifically at enhancing diversity in our research workforce, perhaps modeled on a similar program from NHLBI called PRIDE that brings in postdocs and junior investigators for a summer long program of coursework, grantsmanship training, small research projects, and networking with mentors. We also look forward to trying to increase the breadth of applicants to our T32 training program by offering a webinar for potential applicants and widely advertising it. Finally, we recognize there are two partners in training, the trainees and their mentors. In 2022, NINR plans to engage in new efforts to focus on mentor training, including trying to adapt the lessons learned from the National Research Mentor Network. Uh, to a clinical researcher uh, mentor workforce. Turning now to some updates on our efforts related to COVID-19. NINR is participating in a funding opportunity to support community interventions to study the impact of the pandemic on health disparity and vulnerable populations. This initiative was developed under the COVID initiative focused on the social, behavioral, and economic impacts of COVID-19 on health disparity and vulnerable populations. We're currently funding one project under that program awarded to Dr. Andrea Wallace at the University of Utah. This project is assessing whether community service use can improve COVID-related health outcomes. Also as a reminder, NINR is supporting several RADx projects. RADx, which stands for Rapid Acceleration of Diagnostics. Um, so the RADx initiative is a national call for scientists and organizations to bring their innovative ideas for new COVID-19 testing approaches and strategies. As shown on this slide, there are two RADx Up projects underway and one pro project under RADx Rad. So RADx Up again is RADx underserved populations and RADx Rad is RADx Radical. So phase two of RADx UP was launched just a few weeks ago with several announcements for funding um, by NIH shown here. Projects funded under phase two RADx UP will apply the scientific knowledge gained in phase one to continue exploring and developing strategies to increase COVID-19 testing in underserved and vulnerable populations. The new funding opportunities under phase two are shown here. The first is for competitive revisions uh, to supplement existing awards to add a focus on community-based testing interventions. The due date for that uh, FOA is May 28th, so coming right up. The second is seeking applications for cooperative agreements for research to expand the scope and reach of existing RADx UP testing interventions among underserved and vulnerable populations, and to increase uptake of COVID testing given the availability of vaccines. The third asks for cooperative agreement applications for research on the social ethical and behavioral implications of COVID-19 testing interventions among underserved populations. Also, stay tuned uh, to the NIH guide for expected future announcements about the return to school phase two initiative. So this notice encourages researchers to leverage existing partnerships and build new partnerships with key stakeholders to develop and implement 
specific targeted approaches for school testing strategies to safely return children and staff to in-person school environments in underserved communities. As you know, one of the challenges uh, we're confronting across all areas of science is the lack of diversity in the research workforce. That's one of the challenges that the UNITE initiative seeks to address. And I wanna bring you, your attention to a list of existing initiatives that are focused on addressing this issue. We're participating in all of these and I encourage you to visit the NINR and NIH websites for more information. And of course, you can also reach out to our program staff with any questions. I also wanna draw your attention to a number of programs focused on early stage investigators. Early stage investigators are another priority for all of us at NIH and certainly at NINR. We wanna make sure that these scientists have the opportunity to establish themselves in the workforce. Again, for more information, check out the NINR and NIH websites and feel free to reach out to our staff. Our colleagues in the NIH Office of Disease Prevention recently conducted an in-depth analysis of prevention research supported by all of the NIH institutes, uh, centers, and offices. And they kindly shared some of their findings on NINR's prevention research. So this analysis was, I mean, I can only imagine a tremendous undertaking and the data reflect the period of fiscal years 2012 through 2019. So here are some of the findings that I found really interesting and I thought that you might too. First, prevention projects represented 37% of NINR's research portfolio during this period. This is double the proportion of prevention projects as, at NIH as a whole. 51% of NINR prevention projects included a randomized intervention. And again, this is much higher than the share for NIH as a whole at 17%. 81% of NINR prevention projects included a focus on primary prevention uh, compared to about 66% in the overall NIH portfolio. So I'm very encouraged by these data. They highlight the key role that NINR plays in prevention research at NIH. I, there are a number of other interesting findings. For example, the share of projects focused on preventing disease progression or recurrence grew substantially over this period at NINR. Healthcare delivery was included as an exposure of interest in 25% of NINR prevention projects compared to 5% for NIH as a whole, suggesting NINR has played an important role in this area. But there are exposures and prevention research such as policy in the built environment and stress that have not received much attention at NINR or NIH. I point these out because we know that policy and the environment are intervention targets that, are, that can have a wide population impact. Moreover, stress is thought to underlie some of the large and persistent health inequities in the United States. You may recall that the Office of Research on Women's Health, uh, their director, Dr. Janine Clayton, presented at January Council. In her presentation, Dr. Clayton shared information about the IMPROVE initiative. So IMPROVE stands for Implementing a Maternal Health and Pregnancy Outcomes Vision for Everyone. The initiative is led by uh, NICHD and uh, the Office of Research on Women's Health. Now, its goal is to support research to reduce preventable causes of maternal deaths and improve health for women before, during, and after delivery. In fiscal year uh, 2020, NIH awarded $20 million to 36 projects under IMPROVE. One of those was a supplement funded by NINR and the Office of the Director to Dr. Elevitz at the University of Pennsylvania. The supplement is exploring relationships among maternal stress, such as adverse childhood events and neighborhood deprivation, functional immune profiles, and maternal morbidity in Black women. Earlier, I mentioned the NIH HEAL initiative, 
I thought I'd highlight some of the awards uh, NINR has administered under HEAL, including uh, these four listed here. The first from uh, Dr. Dennis Ang at Wake Forest University is testing the effectiveness of a combined intervention to help manage chronic musculoskeletal pain, which consists of cognitive behavioral therapies and analgesic therapies combined with nurse support to help with adherence. The second from Dr. Sue Gardner at the University of Iowa is exploring wound, patient, and biological factors that are associated with painful wound care that could be used to predict the most appropriate treatments for certain patients. Yo Dr. Yoke Brandt at Drexel University is studying the use of music therapy to help manage pain in advanced cancer patients. And finally, through a small business award, a company named Cognificence Inc. is developing a virtual reality therapy to help uh, in managing chronic pain. Videos of the spring director's lectures are now available on YouTube. On March 4th, uh, Dr. Sarah Zanton, who is the Health Equity and Social Justice Endowed Professor at the Johns Hopkins Hopkins School of Nursing presented Leveraging Strengths to Achieve Health Equity from Clinical Insight to Program of Research. Dr. Zanton discussed her impressive strengths-based capable program for older adults, particularly those trying to age in place. On April 20th, Dr. Ryan Shaw, Associate Professor at the Duke University Schools of Nursing and Medicine and Director of the Health Innovation Lab presented digital health towards the next generation of healthcare delivery and chronic disease management. In his lecture, Dr. Shaw discussed the role that digital health is playing in transforming healthcare delivery and in creating new opportunities for chronic disease management across the lifespan. So let's um, move on uh, to an update on what we've been doing as an NINR staff. As far as updating you on my activities, I continue to be busy with meetings and presentations. Some of my recent meetings among others are listed on this slide. I'm meeting with many of the groups that have an interest in NINR research, such as schools of nursing, uh, friends of the National Institute of Nursing Research, uh, AACN among others. In addition, I recently had uh, the special opportunity to meet with three members of Congress, Representative David Joyce of Ohio and Representative Lucille Roybal Allard of California, who are the co-chairs of the House Nursing Caucus. I also met with Representative Lauren Underwood from Illinois, a nurse who founded the House Black Maternal Health Caucus. Prior to that, I met with staff from the House and Senate Appropriations Subcommittee responsible for most of NIH. All of these were really positive meetings um, and I was able to talk about my vision for NINR research and answer their questions. If I haven't had a chance to meet with you yet, I certainly hope to very soon. Um, there's a lot of optimism about the future in the community and that's very encouraging for all of us. Um, there are many more scheduled meetings in the coming months. I want to recognize Dr. Leo Saligan in our intramural research division for obtaining tenure and becoming a senior investigator. Uh, Leo has been with NINR since 2007 when he arrived as a postdoc. Dr. Saligan's research explores the nature and causes of fatigue in relation to cancer and its treatments. So many congratulations to Leo on this outstanding achievement. I also want to offer my congratulations to NINR's clinical director, Dr. Sue Wingate, who will soon retire from a distinguished career in federal service. I wanted to make sure that I recognize her before she leaves. As the longtime clinical director in our intramural program, Dr. Wingate oversees all clinical and regulatory aspects of the on-campus research activities of NINR scientists. Her own research has examined symptom palliation and end-of-life care in patients with advanced stage heart failure. She's been an amazing resource for countless members of the NINR intramural program over the years. 
And over the last year, she has been a studying presence and trusted resource as Intramural has navigated the challenges of continuing their work at the NIH Clinical Center through the pandemic. All of us at NINR will miss you, Sue, and we wish you the very best on your next adventure. I'd also like to publicly welcome the new staff who have joined NINR since the January Council meeting. They've all jumped right in during very challenging times and have already made critical contributions to the work of the Institute. It's um, really an exciting time, hopefully you've gathered, at NIH and NINR. There are so many new opportunities to advance groundbreaking science and bring about change. And there's a lot of energy and optimism at NINR about the future. We have a great team in place that's already hard at work moving us forward. We're also looking for outstanding individuals to fill important positions on that team. So I'd like to tell you about three positions. Um, all three of these positions I'm gonna tell you about are key senior leadership roles who report directly to me, help guide the direction of the Institute as a whole, and have influential seats at NIH leadership tables, and opportunities to, to develop collaborations across NIH and beyond. We love your help in spreading the word about these positions and passing along names for consideration to the provided email address on your screen. So to start, we've launched a search for the next director of our Division of Extramural Science Programs. The extramural director guides the direction of all extramural nursing science through new research initiatives and leads the management of research grant and training programs that support the mission of NINR. They oversee the extramural grant portfolio, which is currently about $138 million, and oversee a staff of approximately 25 individuals, the majority of whom are scientific staff. The extramural director represents NINR to the extramural scientific community. The director also oversees business related activities associated with the negotiation, award, and administration of grants within NINR. So we think this is a tremendous opportunity for an exceptional nurse scientist to have a national impact. We've also recently announced a search for our next clinical director. The NINR clinical director serves in an important leadership position in our Division of Intramural Research. The Division of Intramural Research currently has an operating budget of about $13 million with about 25 uh, staff and 20 trainees. The clinical director is responsible for the development and oversight of all research activities involving human participants. This includes protocol navigation, supervision of research nurses, and community relationships for participant recruitment and retention. The clinical director serves as a clinical policy advisor and is responsible for the overall quality of research implementation. They will also play a key role in shaping future directions of the intramural research program at NINR. In addition, the clinical director will um, direct their own program of research. Additionally, uh, a search will soon be launched for our next scientific director. The scientific director leads our division of intramural research, which is housed in the world-renowned NIH Clinical Center. We're developing a bold new research agenda for NINR and this individual will shape future directions of NINR intramural research and training. The scientific director provides overall executive direction, coordination, and scientific leadership for the entire division. In addition, the scientific director will lead their own program of research. So more information on each of these positions is available on our website, or in the case of the scientific director, will soon be available on our website. And of course, um, for the latest NINR news, please check the news and notes feature on our website. Uh, to make sure you're always up to date, please consider subscribing to our grant, I'm sorry, to subscribing to our Gov Delivery email service, which you can do also on our website. So that concludes my um, 
remarks and I'm happy to take questions or hear your comments and happy to engage in some discussion. Hi, this is Shirley Moore. And I wanna um, say how pleased I was to see all the initiatives that came, uh, that you're forwarding now as a result of the Pathways Report. Um, the report involved a lot of people, a lot of stakeholders uh, who are uh, interested in research um, training and um, just to see the NINR act so quickly uh, on the recommendations in that report is just feels really good. Uh, and I wanna thank you. Oh, thank you, Dr. Moore. Yeah, your leadership was so essential. We can't thank you and the committee enough. We really value your input and look forward to keeping to push that work forward. So, and keeping you all updated on, um, you know, where things are at and uh, what we can do next. Other comments or questions? Hey, it's, a, it's, it's morning for some people. It's quite early in the morning, right? So it uh, might take us a while to heat up. Any other comments or uh, things you want to put on the table for us? Okay, thanks. Well, I do see uh, Dr. Bernard. Um, we're running pretty early. Uh, Dr. Old, what do you think? Should we move ahead or should we take a break? What do you think? Well, um, perhaps since Dr. Bernard is on, we, we don't want her to, uh, I know her schedule is quite busy. So why don't we go ahead with Dr. Bernard? And um, I think that Unite will, hopefully we'll have some great conversations. Following, the, following her presentation. Excellent. Well, I see now Dr. Bernard. Um, so I'm very pleased to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Marie Bernard. Uh, Dr. Bernard is the Deputy Director of the National Institute on Aging at the NIH. She's also NIH's, oh, I've lost my screen. Okay. Um, <laughs> She's also uh, NIH's Chief Officer for Scientific Workforce Diversity. As uh, NIA's Senior Geriatrician, she serves as the Principal Advisor to the NIA Director, assisting in the oversight of aging and dementia research. She's lectured and published widely in her area of research, nutrition and function in older populations, as well as related to geriatric education. As the Acting Chief Officer for Scientific Workforce Diversity, she co-leads NIH's newly announced UNITE initiative to end structural racism. I'm delighted um, that Dr. Bernard was able to join us today to provide you with an overview of UNITE and answer your questions about this important initiative. Dr. Bernard, welcome. Thank you very much, Dr. Zank. And I really do hope that those people who needed to take a break just went ahead and did that. That's one of the great things about Zoom. Um, and I'm happy to get a few minutes to talk with you about Unite. Um, this is an initiative that was unveiled officially on uh, February 26th, Friday, February 26th, at a special meeting of the advisory committee to the director. And at that time, these are the things that we said. We said that events of the past year 2020 had brought into sharp relief the ongoing reality of racial injustice in our country and the responsibility of all of us to address this issue. And of course, in the following month in March, it was punctuated by the killing of six Asian American women in Georgia. Uh, we had a series of intense institute and center director meetings starting in June of 2020, uh, immediately following the uh, killing of George Floyd that uh, helped identify some initial issues. Uh, we also had a couple of self-assembled affinity groups uh, to approach leadership, a group called ACRE, Eight Concepts for Racial Equity, and the African-American and Black Senior Scientists, as well as the established Anti-Harassment Steering Committee uh, that provided some really candid uh, uh, input that informed next steps. 
And this led to the shared commitment to address structural racism. Uh, we feel that this is a tipping point and we cannot let this moment pass. So what are some of the initial issues that were identified? That we need to make sure that biomedical research and the administrative support system that supports it is devoid of hostility grounded in race, sex, and other federally protected characteristics. In this new initiative, we're committing to delineate elements that may perpetuate structural racism in biomedical research, both within NIH and external to NIH that lead to a lack of personnel inclusiveness, equity, and diversity. We believe that all ideas must be given an equal and fair review regardless of who's putting the idea forward and regardless of the dominant paradigm. And as COVID-19 has made painfully clear, health disparities and inequities continue to contribute to morbidity and mortality in our nation, making it essential for us to redress the fundamental causes and to quickly find programs that can uh, lead to effective interventions. So what we unveiled was the UNITE initiative. Uh, the acronym accounts for the five interacting work streams that uh, are propelling the initiative. One, to understand stakeholder experiences through listening and learning. Another, to look at new research on health disparities, minority health and health equity. Still another for improving the internal NIH culture. Another, holding us accountable and transparent and communicating what we're doing with internal external st stakeholders. And then finally, the E group looking at the extramural research ecosystem and what changes need to be made in policy, culture, and structure. Elaborating further, the U committee is charged with performing a broad systematic self-evaluation to delineate elements that perpetuate structural racism and lead to a lack of diversity, equity, and inclusion, again, internally as well as externally. They are responsible for the RFI that hopefully you had a chance to see and respond to. It was published just that Monday following the advisory committee to the director meeting. Uh, they've been soliciting internal information from the institutes and centers, as Dr. Zank pointed out, there are a number of things that NINR is doing in this space. Um, and they're looking at doing some qualitative data collection. I understand they have listening sessions that will be starting very soon. The end committee is charged with addressing longstanding health disparities issues uh, and issues in health, um, minority health and health equity. Um, they're charged with helping us to be transparent, accountable, and having sustainable resources in this area. Uh, among the things that they've done on February 26, they brought forward a common fund proposal uh, in concept uh, for innovative and transformative research in this area with the very aggressive goal of having two funding opportunity announcements released by March of 2021. Uh, they're also looking at portfolios in IHY and among stakeholders. They're very interested in having an accurate analysis of our investments in this area. As you know, we account for um, our research investments through the RCDC system, which is generally um, using a computerized algorithm to evaluate the abstract and specific aims of projects and to classify them. Uh, but we've tried several times to do so for this category unsuccessfully. So this is a manually curated um, uh, category. And the end committee is really interested in um, where there might be gaps and perhaps overcounting as a result of that and what could be done to improve the system. Uh, they also, at that February 26 meeting, as part of the overall common fund concept that was cleared, uh, proposed that there be uh, additional funding opportunity announcements in this area of health disparities, minority health and health equity for fiscal year 23. The E committee is charged with looking internally at the NIH organizational culture and structure to diverse diverse to, to promote diversity, equity, and inclusion. It's looking at data such as these. What you see here to the left, uh, top horizontal bar is the overall makeup of full-time employee equivalents at NIH. We can contractors, trainees, et cetera, the number would actually be closer to 44,000. Uh, but at first, uh, cut. This is what the Office of Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion was able to provide for us. Um, as you can see, this 
blue is Hispanics, green is non-Hispanic whites, uh, yellow is black or African-American, red is Asian, and gray is American Indian, Alaska Native, Native Hawaiian, Pacific Islander, and two or more races. And then when you look based upon job category, uh, whether one has a scientific role, a health and research role, that's defined as a nurse or lab technician, someone who's directly involved with supporting research, or an infrastructure role, something that undergirds the scientific enterprise, such as being a program analyst or a grants management person or an IT person. There's quite a bit of variety in the demographics, and this committee is really interested in what accounts for that and whether people are seeing barriers and being able to move upward. Similarly, when you look at the NIH leadership, uh, what we call the top five, the institute director, deputy director, scientific director, clinical director, and executive officer, there's room for potentially for more diversity. So this is a committee that's looking at establishing a campaign to make NIH staff aware of options for reporting uh, actions that may be perceived as racist, uh, at expanding recruitment efforts for NIH investigators, particularly those who come in with tenure senior scientists, establishing an anti-racism steering committee and working with NIH senior leadership to Apport, appoint a diversity, equity, and inclusion officer at every institute and center, or have something equivalent at every institute and center um, to track, advance, and coordinate diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts. The E committee is charged with, and I can spell unite, but it flows a little bit better if you talk about the E committee before you talk about the T committee. So the E committee is charged with performing a broad systematic evaluation of NIH external policies and processes to identify identify and change practices and structures. Um, they are looking at things such as these data um, that uh, actually led to the establishment of the role of the Chief Officer of Scientific Workforce Diversity. In 2011, Donna Ginter and colleagues, including Raynard Kington, who'd been the uh, Principal Deputy Director at NIH, published a paper in Science that showed that there was a difference in receipt of R01 equivalent grants from NIH based upon race ethnicity. At initial look uh, across multiple groups, African-Americans, Black, uh, uh, Hispanics, Latinos, um, Asians, um, those groups seem to have, have a disadvantage in getting R01 equivalent grants as compared to non-Hispanic whites. However, after they controlled for lots of different factors, English as a first language, where one was trained, where one was uh, currently working, et cetera, um, those differences went away for all groups except for African Americans and Blacks, uh, and Blacks uh, seem to have a 10 uh, per, uh, percentage uh, disadvantage as compared to non-Hispanic whites. Um, and Dr. Collins turned to his advisory committee and said, asked for recommendations, and they came forward with a number, uh, including the establishment of a chief officer for scientific workforce diversity. Dr. Hannah Valentine was that founding uh, Coswood, as we call it, uh, came on board in 2014 and began looking at the data. And this is what the data looked like in 2013. Still, a, uh, um, this is numbers of applicants. I'll show you success rates in just a moment. Um, where um, you had small numbers of applicants in who were African American and Black in 2013. You can't even see the American Indian and Alaska Natives bar because the numbers are so small a little bit better for Hispanics, but still very small, um, better for Asians. Um, and then Dr. Valentine did an update on this with fiscal year 2018 data that showed that things were getting better. We did an update with 2020 data that sees a continuous trend to numbers getting better, um, going from 425 to 703 uh, uh, African-American and Black applicants, a uh, small increase in Alaska, uh, American Indians and Alaska Natives, uh, et cetera. And then when it comes to funding rates, um, the success rate for African American and Black scientists in 2013 was 12.2%, is now up to 23.6%, an improvement, although there's still a gap, but the numbers remain quite small. And I'll point out that uh, American Indian and Alaska Natives, you can finally see a bar there at least, but um, there's a lot of work to be done, and this is the sort of thing that the E-Committee is looking at. Um, 
They are particularly interested or expressed on February 26th interest in being transparent and having re, uh, um, grantee demographics reported in the NIH data book um, with the idea that transparency can lead to change. And they're looking at things like career pathways, institutional culture, NIH processes, and what more could be done with minority serving institutions to uh, enhance the numbers of applicants, the numbers of people who are successful with applications. And then the T committee, which is a great book again to the U committee, the U committee's understanding the T committee is being transparent and communicating. Um, they are our uh, group that's holding us accountable uh, for all the things that we say we want to do. Um, they led uh, the public commitment to identifying and cor correcting NIH policies that can be can perpetuate structural racism. They led working with the Office of Communications and Public Liaison, the development of the NIH Unite website. If you've not seen it, all you have to do is Google NIH Unite, or you can go to nih.gov slash ending structural racism. Uh, they're looking at uh, developing an internal awareness campaign. They are actively working on diversifying the portraiture around NIH. Um, so I understand that fall councils will still be virtual, but maybe by uh, January council, January, February council, uh, if you're in building 1, 10, or 31, you will see significant difference in the sorts, in the diversity of images that are portrayed around NIH. So on, again, February 26, we said that we would publicly commit to identifying and correcting any NIH policies or practices that may have helped perpetuate structural racism. That we would continue to aggressively implement approaches to address the Ginter gap that I talked about and enhance portfolio diversity. That we would launch a multi-phase tiered and integrated common fund initiative focused on transformative health disparities research to reduce health disparities and inequities that we would ensure a robust NIH-wide commitment to a National Institute of Minority Health and Health Disparities funding opportunity announcement that was under development at the time to address structural racism. And that we would develop a sustainable process to systematically gather and make public the demographics of our internal and our external workforce. Additionally, in terms of things that we're inwardly facing, we said that we would implement policy changes that promote anti-racism and remove barriers to professional growth for staff from diverse backgrounds, including underrepresented groups. That we would appoint a diversity, equity, and inclusion officer at every institute and center uh, with direct access to the institute director to track, advance, and coordinate IC-specific equity and diversity inclusion efforts. And I will make the disclaimer right now that that's been modified, that we will uh, expect that every institute and center will track, advance, and coordinate um, across NIH diversity efforts. Uh, and it'll be up to the institute director to figure out whether that's through an individual or committee that they already have in place, or whatever. And we said that we would extend, expand the Distinguished Scholars Program, a pro intramural program that was established um, three years ago, I guess, um, that has uh, already led to a significant increase in the diversity of the intramural uh, program uh, tenure track uh, uh, scholars or scientists. Uh, it's the basis upon which the first initiative was, was built. Uh, on that day and on the website that opened the following Monday, uh, Francis Collins made this statement. To those individuals in the biomedical research enterprise who have endured disadvantage due to structural racism, I am truly sorry. NIH is committed to instituting new ways to support diversity, equity, and inclusion, and identifying and dismantling any policies and practices at our own agency that may harm our workforce and our science. So that's March 26, I'm sorry, February 26, March 1. Uh, what has happened since then? I'm happy to say quite a bit. Um, the RFI that was released on March 1st, um, we it was supposed to close April 9th. We extended it for a couple of weeks because we heard from a number of scientific societies that they wanted more time to give a very thoughtful response. And we're delighted that we've had more than a thousand responses to it. Um, so the U committee that led this is in the process of trying to evaluate all of those data uh, to help figure out what it tells us about how we should go forward. Um, and 
they will soon be launching internal and external listening sessions. So if you had the opportunity to respond, Thank you very much. We expect at the June 10th, 11th uh, advisory committee to the director that initial report out from this will take place. And in spite of being a long time NIH or a bit dubious, uh, sure enough, uh, the two funding opportunity announcements that were uh, approved in concept on February 26 got released on March 26. One to um, do transformative research to address health disparities and advanced health equity in general. Another one focusing on minority serving institutions, up to $24 million are committed. The total commitment uh, at the uh, February 26th uh, presentation was $60 million. So presumably the other 36 million will be put towards the fiscal year 23 initiative. Um, there was a, a mention that we wanted to have NIH wide commitment to the NIMHD funding opportunity announcement on structural racism and sure enough, uh, March 23rd, that uh, RFA, RFA was released with a commitment of 25 institute centers and offices uh, and up to $30.8 million. The National Institute of General Medical Sciences on its own uh, released a notice of special interest in research on the impact of structural racism and discrimination on biomedical career progression and as the leading institute in funding training grants, this is significant. And the NIH Wide Brain Initiative released uh, in the last several weeks, the first uh, funding opportunity announcement that allows diversity to be considered as part of the scoring criteria. Very specifically, uh, it calls for a plan to enhance diverse perspectives. And that is taken to, into consideration when scoring as opposed to your usual thing, you score it and then what about the diversity? So we're all looking at how this plays out and whether there are generalizable lessons that could be applied to other funding opportunity announcements. And in keeping with the uh, goal of being transparent, the uh, NIH data book recently released uh, data by race, ethnicity, and disability status for the first time. We for a while have had it by sex, gender, and career stage. Now we have these additional data. We also said that we wanted to establish an anti-racism steering committee that's an inwardly facing group. And we did get that started on March 14th. Um, we gave staff uh, basically four days to indicate that they were interested in being involved and getting their uh, supervisor's approval. And we had 391 people at the first meeting. We're now up to more than 460 members. It's open to all members of the NIH workforce. And I recently saw the uh, demographics of it. And it's a very diverse group. It's, it's really trainees, contractors, et cetera. It's, it's I think, going to be a great source of information for us. The goal of this is to uh, address policies and procedures that lead to wrong. It's not at all intended to address individual cases, we have an Office of Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion to, to help us with that. But I think this is just representative of the energy and interest that exists across NIH. So I'll close with this saying by um, uh, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, because we've heard many times from uh, people that they don't necessarily see themselves in this initiative. We think that this is going to be a great opportunity for us to step back and look at everything that we do uh, with the equity lens um, to allow all to have better access uh, and to be more fully represented. Uh, and lessons learned can be applied very specifically to other groups that may not be for specifically uh, racial ethnic groups. Um, Dr. King said, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. And that is absolutely what we are thinking here. And uh, this last slide shows you the uh, listing of members of the um, uh, various uh, um, UNITE committees. I will point out Dr. Shannon Zank is a member of the N committee that I've mentioned. Um, I'm very privileged to co-chair this initiative with Dr. Larry Tabak, the principal deputy director and Dr. Alfred Johnson. Uh, the Deputy Director for Management here at NIH. Um, and I would be happy to stop at this point and answer any questions that you have. Terrific, thank you so much, Dr. Bernard. I um, actually asked John Lowe, um, Dr. Lowe, if you would help and lead the discussion uh, with the council members and Dr. Bernard, thank you. 
Great, thank you, greetings. Um, and thank you, Dr. Bernard, for that uh, great overview and this exciting uh, initiative. And um, I think it's encouraging and, to, and especially to, you know, to be able to see that um, our leading research uh, institution is taking this initiative and um, is um, being proactive and not only reactive, but there's some proactivity there, uh, I think that we see. And so thank you. It's, um, and thank you for your leadership in um, leading this effort, um, which is very appreciated. Um, I'll lead off the discussion if that's okay. And with just a comment, um, <clears throat> being Native American, um, you know, it's pretty striking to see and not, un, not necessarily unknown to us who are Native that the, just the uh, gap in researchers, in, investigators who are Native and uh, or indigenous, if we want to group all the groups together as indigenous, and uh, the gap in those who are applying for funding and the gap that uh, have received funding, and so um, I think, and then the gap I see the you know the gap even those who are uh, uh, present at involved at NIH itself, there seems to be a large gap. Um, and I know this is probably nothing new to you. If I'm correct, you were at University of Oklahoma for quite a while. And so you know what that's like. So my follow-up, I guess, comment, maybe question is, since there's such a gap, um, you know, it looks like we still are at the gate with preparing scientists who are native or indigenous. And, um, that there still seems to be that issue in our institutions of higher learning, in our uh, preparation to become scientists. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm acutely aware of what that looks like in nursing. Um, you know, we have such low numbers of even PhD prepared indigenous native nurses. And so <clears throat> it seems like there may be um, some need for support in that space. And so I just um, would like to get your thoughts about that, if that's being considered, discussed, or, um, yeah, thank you. Thank you, and, and, and thank you for the kind words. Um, yes, I spent, I grew up in Oklahoma, got my education elsewhere, went back to Oklahoma. You know, there are a lot of issues uh, there uh, and across the country. Um, Part of what we are hoping we can do with this UNITE initiative is to um, really put laser focus on enhancing and advancing things um, for various groups such as American Indian and Alaska Natives, Native Hawaiian, Pacific Islanders, yes, African Americans and Blacks and Hispanics. And the, the E Committee very specifically is looking at minority serving institutions, you know, what are our policies and practices that are serving as barriers? Uh, what are some of the things that we need to change in the way that we do our training programs that can allow things to be more inclusive? You know, uh, some of the training mechanisms are limited to only a small number of institutes and centers. You know, that's a barrier. Um, so we're looking at all of those things as systematically as possible uh, and working with the uh, responsible agents uh, within NIH. Uh, it's really nice that the e-committee that's looking at these extramural things, um, I should have mentioned that each of the committees has three co-chairs, um, often uh, a fairly senior person, but also definitely someone who's not the usual suspect in leadership. And for the e-committee, um, John Lorsch, who's the uh, director of the National Institute of General Medical Sciences is one of the co-chairs. Um, that's, the, that's the institute that has the uh, largest number of training uh, programs for NIH. So he and the team are really thinking very critically about this. I anticipate, although I have not seen with 80 plus people on this committee, you don't know all of the details of what people are doing, but I anticipate that the E-Committee is going to be coming forward with some recommendations at this June 11th, I think 
we're going to be scheduled to present on June 11th of that two-day ACD meeting, uh, some uh, things that will help um, to accelerate things. Uh, I can certainly say that from the Scientific Workforce Diversity Office perspective, uh, we work very closely with the Diversity Program Consortium that's led by NIGMS and the Common Fund um, and see some opportunities to build upon that. And we're really excited about the first initiative and what might happen there. It, it's not really going to be specifically making outreach to particular populations, but hopefully there'll be a diversity of uh, scientists who are brought into this that will help uh, in filling uh, these pathways that really need to be uh, you know, very robust um, with lots of uh, efforts to remove barriers along the way. So um, please hold us accountable. We expect to be reporting out at the advisory committee to the director every June in December of what we've accomplished and what we hope to accomplish. And it's a venue in which there can be feedback. Um, if not, you know, that day, there's always that opportunity for follow-up subsequently. We have a website, a Unite website, where you want to give feedback there. Um, we need to have that uh, transparency and uh, to hear from other than ourselves as we think about all of this. Dr. Bernard, thank you for your presentation. That was great. And I'm very encouraged, like John said, to see that NIH and NINR, I mean, the whole organization is looking inside the organization also and externally. I was, uh, I was curious if you could expand more on how you mentioned that diversity would be part of the scoring criteria. What, how will that take place and what would that include? So what I have seen of the funding opportunity announcement, I would encourage you to just go to the URL and take a look yourself, is that at every point of consideration, the significance, the um, team, the methodology, et cetera, the applicant has to address how um, diverse uh, plans to enhance diverse perspectives is going to help with those components of the scoring. And so it's just built into everything. Um, that's where we are going to have to step back and analyze it. Uh, I know that the director of our Center for Scientific Review, quite honestly, and she said this publicly, has her um, doubts about how effective this may be because if the behavior of a review panel is to look at that, but then say, but this is a Nobel Prize winner, so we can't not give them a great score, then it's not going to be an effective intervention. Um, whereas if the um, behavior is different, it could be very effective. Um, so we're going to have to monitor and see. A lot of it will be um, how scientific review officers convey things, how uh, uh, review uh, panel chairs convey things, how colleagues, you know, what the peer pressure is to adhere to this new um, uh, way of thinking about things. But the beauty of this is that it is an RFA, so it will be you know, very specialized focus, um, so you can really get the message across. And what I've seen, at least with, uh, I was very involved with the inclusion uh, across the lifespan policy, that people got it pretty quickly, you know, that this is something that needed to be considered. Um, um, you know, it's a lot of smart people apply for NIH money, so um, We'll see. Uh, Dr. Bernard, uh, Mallory Johnson from the University of California, San Francisco. Thank you. Also, I also want to thank you for a, a very um, a comprehensive presentation. And I'm so I'm also very encouraged by um, by this initiative and how the many facets and uh, and also the involvement across the spectrum of uh, both intramurally at NIH as well as uh, extramurally. One of the things that I kept honing in on, and we, we talk about this a lot in our training programs, is that drop-off that you highlighted um, for R01 level um, applicants and recipients uh, from underrepresented backgrounds. And so it, it seems that there's been a lot of work, and it, it seems, and perhaps easier to, um, to encourage diversity and representation in training programs, whether it's T32s, uh, or other training programs. It's a lot harder at the R01 level. I noticed um, 
just earlier this month, there was a notice of special interest that came out for, um, it, but it looks like it was signed on, I pulled it up, uh, only for NINDS, NIDA, and NIAAA, encouraging uh, R01 applications from underrepresented uh, investigators. And I was wondering if that came out of this initiative, it seems uh, quite timely, um, but also um, only three institutes seem signed on to it. And I didn't know if there were other uh, interventions or um, that are really targeting that level. So getting to the independent funding uh, for underrepresented investigators. Thank you for the question. And, and yes, there are a lot of things that are developing now because yes, everyone's been thinking about this since last summer. Um, and they've been very anxious to get going with things. And they basically were told, wait a minute, we'd like to be able to officially unveil Unite before you start doing these things. Uh, but quite honestly, when I took on this role as the acting Coswood in October, I went online and looked at diversity initiatives for NIH. And there's 67 of them. Um, so there have been a lot of things going on across NIH for a while. Uh, what, another great opportunity UNITE provides us is for us to step back and look at all those things. What are the lessons that have learned, been learned? What's effective? What might be useful to bring together to hopefully have an exponential effect as opposed to possibly just an additive effect? Um, so that's part of what um, I think is going to come from what we are doing here, but it is definitely a process. Um, and um, I, I don't think you'll be hearing a report out about that at the June ACD meeting, but maybe by December, we will have gotten that a little bit better organized. Um, so apropos that very specific uh, FOA that you're mentioning, I, I can only imagine that the focus was um, uh, a neuroscience related thing that they all had in common. And that's the reason they did it in that fashion. Uh, but I think uh, that that's something that we will begin to look at in a more coordinated fashion across UNITE and certainly from the scientific workforce diversity office perspective, because that has implications for diversification of the scientific workforce. Can I ask a follow-up question? Um, Christopher Lee from Boston College. Excellent presentation, Dr. Bernard. So I was kind of fixated, I think, on that funding gap slide, and I appreciate the NIH initiative to be much more transparent about that. Um, and as you mentioned, I think a lot of us look forward to seeing that like in the NIH data book, because it's a good way to highlight some of those enduring inequities. And, and I agree, it was lovely to see the change really between 2013 and 2020, but there is still this residual ridiculous gap in the rates of funding for RO and equivalents. So my question is specifically, has there any been any discussion about fixing actually that, the funding? Is there any, any discussion about at what rate should we fund R01 submissions within those racial categories? Because in addition to kind of the research emphasis on health inequities and looking at training institutions, like there, there also can be a way to fix the gap by actually fixing the funding rates. So again, you guys ask wonderful questions. Um, with regards to those data being posted, I would encourage you to take a look at the um, NIH Scientific Workforce Diversity website. We have all of that uh, very nicely displayed there. Uh, and one of the things that, one of the other trends is being seen is that back in 2013, there was a K award funding gap. There is no longer a K award funding gap. Again, the numbers are very, very small, but that's encouraging that we're making some progress. Um, there are also data from the Diversity Program Consortium, which was another one of the initiatives that was launched in response to the advisory committee to the director, um, making outreach to um, uh, under-resourced and minority serving institutions to help build their pathway of up and coming uh, scientists. Uh, they have a national research mentoring network uh, and a number of other initiatives. And those, all of those things show uh, improving numbers, still not as rapidly as many would like, but. You know, and we are interested in really accelerating that rate. So apropos the issue of the funding discrepancies and what can we do immediately, uh, Michael Lauer, uh, Director of the Office of Extramural Research and Team, um, did a recent analysis uh, to try to 
get a better handle on this because there have been several other articles since the Ginter article looking at this. Uh, in particular, one by Hope and colleagues that uh, thought that they saw that there was a difference in the rate at which um, applications from African American and Black scientists got discussed um, um, and uh, thus differential funding rates. What Lauer and colleagues found, and this was published in eLife just last month, um, is that 50% um, of African American and Black scientists tended to apply uh, or submit applications that were related to like 13 different topical areas. Um, and when you looked at those topical areas, they matched to certain institutes and centers that didn't have as robust a success rate for R1 equivalent grants, NINR being one of them, NIMHD being another. Um, and that is, you know, that's kind of baked in. That's the, the allocations for the institutes and centers are legislatively directed, you know, what Congress gives them. Um, so much of that difference um, being related to limited topics hopefully will be somewhat addressed by these common fund initiatives that are pouring more money into these. I personally am very interested in that 50% of the African and American black scientists who didn't apply in those limited areas and how are they different and what do we need to know differently about them? Um, and uh, haven't had the opportunity, the bandwidth really to pursue that as yet, but um, maybe after this advisory committee to the director meeting when hopefully this marathon that we're on will kind of be on a sustainable pace, there'll be an opportunity to, to step back and look, those, look at those sorts of things. All right, thank you very much. This is Joellen Wilbur from Rush University. Thank you very much for your presentation and all the work you're doing. I think you kind of answered the question I had just in the last moment, but I'll address it anyway. Um, I was really impressed when Shin and Zank mentioned that NINR is, is kind of taking a lead in prevention research or interventions related to prevention. And I was wondering, again, with uh, if you've looked at or drilled down deep, and it sounds like you have from what you last said, as to what grants they are submitting or what areas of science various ethnic or racial groups are addressing and how does that break down a bet by racial ethnic groups? So the Lauer analysis was specifically looking at African-American and black scientists. Um, so that's the one that I can definitively address in terms of um, data. Um, I can anecdotally note that um, in my experience, for instance, as deputy director of the National Institute on Aging, we've had for, um, 30 plus years now, something called Resource Centers on Minority Aging Research. Um, and it tends to attract people of, from underrepresented groups. And they tend to be asking questions that are health disparities related questions. Um, but I don't have the data to very specifically address that for you uh, relative to a group other than the African-American and Black group. Thank you. Mm -hmm. This is Shirley Moore from Case Western Reserve University. Um, in institutions that I am part of and have been part of, usually um, not only is there an institutional plan for inclusion and diversity, there's also kind of a, a, almost a mandate or a requirement that subunits have one, a plan specific to that department or subunit because it can address the nuances of a particular group of people, such as a school of nursing, for example. And so I was wondering if you were seeing that as a possibility that a subunit such as NANR would have a specific um, plan for increasing inclusion and diversity uh, as well. Um, that's a great question. You know, what I was alluding to when I was saying that the uh, idea of a diversity, equity, and inclusion officer at every institute and center is, is changing. It became evident as we talked this through from February 26 to now that it should have been evident to begin with. Every institute and center is different. 
Uh, there's some institutes and centers that are really ready to go forward with having this chief office for diversity, equity, inclusion. Some that say, you know, I have people who do this sort of thing. I have a committee that does this sort of thing. I don't have the resources to do this sort of thing. So uh, what we're moving towards now is uh, to have in the performance uh, expectations for institute and, direct and, and center directors effective fiscal year 22, i.e. October 1 of 20, uh, a, a, a diversity, equity, and inclusion element that would call for the institute director to be accountable for diversity, equity, and inclusion um, um, related to the scientific workforce, related to the non-scientific workforce, potentially uh, related to uh, research initiatives, coordinated with the Office of Scientific Workforce Diversity, with the Equity, Diverse, Diversity, and Inclusion Office. And these would be parameters that Francis Collins and Larry Tabak, the principal deputy director, will be looking at when it comes time for that institute and center director's evaluation. So it will be up to the institute and center director how they want to make that happen. That will, in many cases, be a plan like that. There's also um, work afoot to um, develop, it's not fully diverse equity inclusion, but racial equity plans for each institute and center, uh, akin to the anti-harassment plans that were developed for each of the institutes and centers um, a couple of years ago when uh, there was a lot of focus on sexual harassment. Um, and that would be another component. Uh, and then finally, I can say that um, the current administration is really interested in these issues. Um, and between Congress and the current administration, um, I think all of the um, uh, operating divisions, as they call them, um, uh, across the government will be developing diversity, equity, inclusion, and a con um, accessibility plans uh, um, to be fully responsive to the um, administration's expectations. And whenever there's something like that that's developed, it cascades down to everyone else. Um, so there's already thought going forward in, as to how that would look for NIH. Given that there's so many moving parts right now with night and other things, we may not have that fully ready for another um, and maybe next year this time that we have it fully ready, but all of those things are in the process of consideration. Thanks for your great presentations. Uh, I am Uno Kim from Emory University. Uh, my question is, uh, are there any possibilities to include racial and ethnic minority stakeholders in the process? Uh, for instance, I am in the American Nurses Association National Commissions to Address Racism uh, in Nursing, and we have a research subgroup, and I think there are many other groups like that. So uh, I am hoping that there would be possibilities that, uh, I mean, these groups could get engaged. Thank you for that. Yes, we're very interested in hearing, you know, up until February 26, we were just talking among ourselves. So we're really interested now in hearing, you know, being tested, inter having interchange with people beyond ourselves. The first step towards that was the request for information that our team is really trying to work out and understand. Um, we are starting listening sessions. Um, I think the first set of listening sessions are going to be internal so they can work out the kinks, but then there will be external listening sessions. Uh, and certainly, uh, Larry Alfred and I are very open to interacting uh, with various groups as they approach us and say that they want to talk more and better understand uh, what's going on. Um, the um, organized means of gathering input that's being led through the listening sessions, et cetera from my perspective, is going to be most impactful because it's being gathered in a systematic fashion, but we are absolutely always open to talking. Hi, this is Cindy Monroe from the University of Miami, and the, the presentation was really fascinating, and this is really important work, so thank you for undertaking it. Um, my question is really, uh, it, I'm reflecting on the slide that um, Shannon Zank showed about prevention research and how it was represented across NIH and in, in NINR. Um, and I'm assuming that there'll be a similar sort 
of outcome of the analysis that's currently ongoing to look at health equity. But I wondered if there is any sense at NIH of what the health equity portfolio looks like at present and whether it also concentrates um, as applications from uh, minority investigators concentrate in particular institutes. So the latter part of your question, I think, yes, uh, it, you know, those of those 50% of African American and Black scientists that were looked at by Laura et al., they tended to be looking at health equity, health disparity sorts of research, and that tended to be uh, five of the six most commonly used institutes for those applications uh, were um, places like NINR, NIMHD, et cetera. In terms of what the full portfolio currently looks like, I would have to turn to Dr. Zank because is that something that the, that's something that the end committee is looking at right now, is that correct? It is, that committee is working on that as we speak. Mm -hmm. Okay. Hello, I'm Yvette Conley from the University of Pittsburgh, and my uh, my thoughts are, you know, um, when you have capacity at any particular level, um, you know, and you're putting out opportunities for folks to apply for training grants, career development grants, um, our level grants, and hoping that we're going to increase the number of applicants and successful, uh, successfully funded applicants from um, underrepresented groups. One of the thoughts that I have is, you know, um, also building capacity upstream so that we have enough folks who can apply. Um, and, and is UNITE or NIH at all um, attempting to build capacity a little bit further down? You know, in other words, you know, thinking K to 12, um, you know, I know, you know, I don't know that that is, has historically been a place that NIH has put their resources, but it seems like federally funded investigators have great capacity and infrastructure to, um, you know, sort of impact that pathway upstream to then have a positive impact on, you know, the number of people who can apply um, for funding. And so I was just wondering if NIH and, and UNITE has any thoughts about how they might be able to build capacity by moving things a little bit further upstream and encouraging, um, you know, more folks from underrepresented uh, groups um, to become scientists. I think another great question, you know, there are a lot of really nice studies that demonstrate that uh, um, the further along uh, young people get in their education, the more firmly certain stereotypes get embedded, you know, that a scientist is a white male in a white coat as opposed to, you know, you or me. And um, so making outreach at early stages is important. Uh, I have learned through this UNITE initiative that we can and that we do have some outreach to um, K through 12 even, uh, generally led again by the National Institute of General Medical Sciences that does a lot of the training. The National Heart, Lung and Blood Institute uh, has some programs and apparently uh, congressionally designated funds to do that sort of thing. And yet I do recall um, that a few years back, um, NIH was being taken to task, but why are we doing things uh, at the high school level? Because that's not really our remit, that that's more the National Science Foundation. So it's kind of, uh, uh, depending, I guess, on uh, what uh, is currently going on um, uh, with Congress, et cetera, how readily we can do those sorts of things. But we certainly um, have some of our institutes and centers who make that direct, direct outreach. Uh, we look to collaborations with our colleagues at the National Science Foundation who truly have this with, you know, clearly within their remit. Um, as Acting Coswood, I've had a chance to see quite a bit of the back and forth uh, with NSF. Um, and um, again, I'm not sure where things are in terms of things that will be recommendations, particularly from this e-committee, but I, I, they're trying to look you know, very thoughtfully and carefully at all aspects of the pathway, recognizing that there's no one thing that's going to be the cure here. It has to be a multi-factorial approach. 
Dr. Bernard, thank you for a wonderful overview. I'm Joanne Wolf from uh, Dana-Farber in, in Boston. Um, I'm wondering what the benchmarks for success or outcomes are and whether or not um, Unite is going to hold itself accountable for those outcomes in sort of uh, how we're gonna measure success. That was the question that was asked by one of the ACD members on February 26th. And I said, we are on a marathon, maybe even an ultra marathon. And what this is gonna look like um, five years from now is not totally clear. We know what our goal is, and we know that we're gonna have mile markers along the way of these ACD meetings. And, and you know, we put out some of the things that we anticipate to have accomplished by this coming June meeting. Uh, many of which I shared with you just now. At the June meeting, we will have a clearer sense of the path ahead and we'll be able to put out some markers for the December meeting and beyond. Um, our ultimate goal is to make a significant difference um, so that you cannot predict the likelihood that someone is gonna be successful based upon their race ethnicity. Um, but um, you know, it, it's gonna have to be in an incremental fashion. Um, so the T committee uh, keeps pushing their colleagues and these other work streams. What is it that you're going to get done? What are your top three things? What's the timeline? How are we going to measure that? Uh, and you know, we're going to count on people like you as well to be asking the same questions. I have another question. Uh, Dr. Bernard, um, and I think I failed to mention that um, I'm at University of Texas at Austin. And uh, so, um, you know, uh, I, looking at when notices of intent are published and then the, then the RFAs are published, um, and this may be logistical and I, I'm not sure of the details, but um, for many of us that, you know, work with our own communities in my own experience with my own tribe or in other tribes, by the time we get through the entire process of beginning to discuss and get the approvals, et cetera, the letter of intent date has gone, the mm -hmm. application due date has gone, and it just seems like we're, you know, peddling upstream, you know, trying to meet these deadlines, but also do everything we need to do to get that engagement and and uh, approvals. So I don't know if there's any uh, been any discussion around maybe extending some of those due dates. That's a very good point, and I I'm not aware of, of uh, discussion along those lines. Um, and we'll be happy to pass it on to the members of the E committee who will be coming up with recommendations. They may have discussed it. I just have not been made aware. Uh, I can certainly say again reverting to my role as deputy director of the National Institute on Aging, we, we did hear concerns of that sort expressed. And so we began the practice of publishing after our council meetings, the concepts that were approved um, with the caveat that um, just because the concept has been approved doesn't guarantee that it will end up as a funding opportunity announcement. But that gives a little bit of extra notice to the community so they can begin thinking about um, what they might do in response. Um, so, you know, that's an antidote of what one IC is doing. I, I need to check with the people in the e-committee and, and make sure they're thinking about this. This has been a very terrific discussion, and I want to thank Dr. Bernard for all the time that you've given us this morning, and Dr. Lowe for kicking it off. Um, everybody was terrific. I think what I would um, like to suggest is that we take a very short break, because um, we've been, been all very engaged here before we hear from um, Dr. Fields. As you can tell, we have a little um, uh, pattern to our discussions today, Unite and then inclusion, and then our strategic plan, uh, and then of course our closed session also. So I think that um, we're very much enjoying uh, the conversations that you're having with the speakers, and I hope that continues uh, for the rest of the day. So I would like to suggest a um, maybe a 10 minute break, coming back at quarter after, we'll get back exactly on time with the agenda. Uh, so I'm gonna go ahead and turn my screen off,
And then I see that Dr. Uh, Fields is on as well as Dr. Redmond. So we'll be ready to go as soon as we hit 1215. Thank you all. Our next agenda item is on uh, inclusion and research. We're gonna have two speakers and then we'll do discussion following that. But before we move to the speakers, I'd like to just share uh, to start some of the NINR most recent data on inclusion. So you have that in mind as we move forward with the presentations. So I'm gonna share my screen. Okay, so um, every three years, uh, each uh, NIH Institute and Center uh, prepares a report on inclusion of women and minorities in research. Um, the data that are the most current um, that are publicly available are from a 2019 report reflecting enrollments between 2016 and 2018. Um, so uh, I'm going to just share a couple tables. So this first one is on um, inclusion by sex and then across the three years. Uh, you can see that NINR research uh, disproportionately enrolls females with females comprising between 63% and 83% of the samples. Again, these are for the years 2016 through 2018. And then uh, these two tables show by year enrollment, by race, and by ethnicity. Um, so for me, one of the take homes from this table is that African Americans comprised uh, during this time period uh, between 17 and 22% of those enrolled in NINR extramural research. Um, this is, you know, of course, higher than their representation in the U.S. population, and I think this is um, positive news, given that African Americans have higher morbidity and mortality for a number of health conditions. Um, American Indian and Alaska Native individuals may be somewhat up, underrepresented in NINR extramural research. And um, another takeaway from this table is that while enrollment of Latinx participants grew from about 7% to about 10% over this three year period, uh, Latinx individuals remain underrepresented in NINR extramural research relative to the US population and their burden of health disparities. So I just wanted to share those data before uh, we moved into the talks today on inclusion. So um, I'd first like to introduce our first speaker, um, Dr. Sheldon Fields. Dr. Fields is the Associate Dean uh, for Equity and Inclusion at the Pennsylvania State University College of Nursing. Dr. Fields has significant experience researching healthcare disparities, specifically focused on preventing HIV AIDS in men of color. Dr. Fields is also the first male registered nurse selected for the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation Health Policy Fellowship Program. Um, so welcome, Dr. Fields. Good evening, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Can you hear me, uh, Dr. Zink? Is it coming through okay? Yes. Oh, okay, all right. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to talk about a topic that is near and dear to my heart. Uh, and that is the issues related to equity inclusion, um, as well as uh, how do we get to the discussion about developing a program of anti-racist research on a more purposeful standpoint. Um, I'll, do, I'll make one other note that, that while I am also the current first vice president of the National Black Nurses Association, that is not the capacity I am here it's talking within. But it, is also, but it is a lens in which uh, I have a view on what it is we are doing. So just gonna share a few things with you today, gonna go through this rather quickly um, about the need for, for this type of research and how do we put up an agenda? And I never discuss an issue or problem without leaving uh, some uh, thoughts around how do we address it? Because I do believe that ultimately, we're at the point in this discussion where we really need to move to action. So, you know, nothing more uh, underscores this issue than this statement by Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King that really speaks to the heart of the issues that we continue to contend with 
when it comes to overall health care in our country. And it's, it's because of our for-profit, you know, tiered health care system that leaves out so many millions with even access to basic care services. Even things such as the passage of the Affordable Care Act in 2010, while it moved the needle some, but it did not do enough. And the attempts at stripping away of certain provisions, such as the individual mandate, has weakened its overall impact. When we couple this issue with our country's past and current medical apartheid issues and its failures to adequately address a myriad of healthcare disparities, the importance and the need for an anti-research agenda truly does begin to emerge. And we all know, or we at least should know and appreciate how did we get here? Because the current social upheavals and, and the protests that, that we all uh, encountered last summer are rooted in a very long history of discrimination and oppression, mainly against Black and other people of color in this country, dating way back to 1619 with the arrival of slaves to this country. The tensions we all witnessed and many of us felt were an outcry for social justice and as a reaction to the multiple killings of BIPOC people at the hands of law enforcement officers that in this country continues to struggle with its long history and is now come to have a racial reckoning, the foundation of which we actually saw. But I see this as an opportunity. All of the killings, as you know, date back many years. It was a reason for the Black Lives Matter movement being resurged. And it was basically the images uh, shown to us all around the world, the catalyst of George Floyd uttering his very last words, I can't breathe that sparked this social movement. The recent conviction, however, of former officer Chauvin was a welcome outcry by most, but not by all, underscoring the, the very diverse nature of this issue and a large amount of work that we all still have yet to do. So I'm really clear that this is not just about diversity, equity, and inclusion. It is about how do we move to and embrace an issue of being anti-racist. So I turn to the work of Dr. Ibram Kendi, who believes that there is no in-between space of being not racist, that one is either racist or anti-racist, and that one either supports racist or anti-racist policies. The claim of not being, or this sort of race neutral, is really just a mask for racism itself. And of course, the difference being uh, how do you, uh, how he defines who's a racist and who's an anti-racist. Uh, a racist endorses the overall idea of a racial hierarchy, an anti-racist endorses the idea of racial equity, of, of equality. Research is also either racist and supports racist policies or anti-racist and supports anti-racist policies, whether it is, uh, one is aware of it or not. So what is this need for inclusion? and anti-racism that we're talking about. So, you know, doing research in this country comes with a bit of a checkered past, especially for people of color communities. The issues of medical mistrust are real and have been earned by the past atrocities. As some that are marked on this slide, uh, many of you are familiar, of course, with the Tuskegee syphilis study, the stealing of Henrietta Lacks HeLa cells, the forced sterilization of women of color in the South, and most recently, the discrimination faced by Dr. Susan Moore, a female black physician who took the YouTube to voice, voice her concerns related to not being fully treated for COVID-19 that actually eventually did take her life. We all know about the landmark IOM study of unequal treatment um, that really uh, showed us uh, that even with equal access and everything, there were still uh, disparate outcomes in, in healthcare. But if we talk about healthcare disparities, and you know, I really like the definition by the World Health Organization that breaks down a definition as the differences in health outcomes that are closely linked with socioeconomic environmental disadvantage, often driven by social conditions in which individuals live, learn, work. I always add die because I don't think people really understand that, and play. So we couple the fact that we have all these healthcare disparities with the ongoing issues of the social determinants of health. Because without a doubt, the healthcare disparities are driven and exacerbated by the social determinants of health. And you know, nothing more defines or determines your health status in our country more than one zip code. 
which really shines a spotlight on the neighborhood and physical environmental social determinants of health. And overall, this slide by Kaiser, which really lays it out very nicely, still simply points out all of the things that can lead to disparate health outcomes. And the social determinants of health provides for a host, however, of variables that we as researchers can choose to tackle in conducting anti-racist research. It really does lay out an agenda of sorts if you think about it that way. And there's plenty of exemplars about the healthcare disparities that we're talking about. Uh, you know, the summary slide here talks about how African-Americans are likely to die at early stages from all causes of uh, healthcare conditions, especially things such as high blood pressure, diabetes, and stroke. But we have some other exemplars. One very prominent exemplar health disparities that is ripe for anti-racist research is the area of maternal mortality. Black and other women of color are exponentially more times likely to die from a pregnancy uh, while in pregnancy related to their white counterparts. Another example are, is the disparate outcomes that we still continue to see in things like breast cancer, while incidence in mortality where we see black women while having a slightly lower incidence of breast cancer than white women still have higher mortality rates. The HIV AIDS pandemic has been going on for over 40 years. And today we still see a huge disparity in health uh, incident, HIV incidence. While African-Americans make up roughly 13% of the population, they still represent about 50% of all new HIV cases. Now, HIV AIDS prevention is my personal area of research. And I've been at this a very long time. And um, NINR, very early on in my career, was a place where my research, specifically focusing on young men of color whose primary risk for HIV was sex with other men, um, I was told in no uncertain terms by plenty of, re of, of program officers that it was that NINR was not a place for my type of research. And I never felt welcome in any of those submissions made to NINR. Now, COVID-19 did not all of a sudden cause healthcare disparities, but it took advantage of and has shown a very pillar light on the death of existing health disparities in Black and other people of color communities. From the very beginning of the pandemic, we saw high incidence and we saw high death rates among Blacks for all of the various reasons that are listed here uh, about why did we see those, those disparate outcomes, the overrepresentation of one of Blacks in the quote unquote essential uh, uh, workforce. Uh, this population just simply could not shelter at home as other populations did, just as an exemplar. Now, if one is really going to do and pursue doing anti-racist research, we not only must understand uh, the definition of health equity, and this definition of health equity by Dr. Kamara Jones, the former president of the American Public Health Association, really uh, underscores uh, where I think we really do need to move. And she defines health equity as the assurance of conditions for optimal health for all people. Dr. Jones further states, that this is only truly possible when you do three things, provide resources according to need, value all individuals and populations equally, and by recognizing and rectifying historical injustices. This is an anti-racist research agenda. But what does this have to do with nursing? And I wanna be really clear. Uh, as a nurse of 30 years, this is my 30 year anniversary of being an RN this year. I know I'm not the only one uh, here that can, can state, you know, many decades of being an RN. And I'm very proud of being an RN. You know, as part of the largest, uh, you know, segment of the healthcare workforce and the most trusted healthcare profession, one of the things that I also still know about nursing is that at 90% female and 80% white, we are not a diverse profession. We have not been for a very long time. Uh, the needle has been moved somewhat but we still have a great deal of work to do within our profession. So what else is it that we need to do in order to move the mark in, in nursing? Well, if we're talking about a, a research agenda, 
And we're talking about nursing uh, being so intimately tied. If nursing is responsible for a lot of the, uh, touches so many lives, the ANA code of ethics gives nursing all of the justification it needs to, to make a major stance in doing anti-racist uh, research. Very quickly, provision two of the code reminds us as nurses of our primary commitment, which means that as researchers, we can focus our work on a particular unit that will benefit, that, that will benefit the most from our collective uh, efforts. Provision four of the code reminds us that we are accountable and responsible for our practice. And as such, we take our obligation to promote health and provide optimal care seriously. Then we should be out here generating all sorts of research questions to specifically address the various social determinants of health, the health disparities, and what I'm now calling the nursing determinants of health. Because if nursing touches the most lives, then truly nursing is somewhat complicit in the sustainment of healthcare disparities. But we don't really talk about or address the nursing determinants of health. Provision seven of the code directly talks to our role in advancing the profession through research and scholarly inquiry. Hence doing anti-racist nursing research, I think is what we are supposed to be doing. Provision eight, of the code clearly states our role in working in collaboration with others to reduce health disparities. This talks to the fact that we as nurses can work on and should be working within research teams to do just this. The recent release of the Future of Nursing report also clearly addresses and clearly gives us some direction. And it talks all about health equity, which is why the work from Dr. That Kamara Jones was so important in my previous slide, because health equity is going to be achieved through 10 desired nursing outcomes. And it, the, the report talks about the elimination of the disproportionate disease burden carried by specific segments of the US population. And that how nurses should reflect the people and communities served throughout the nation, helping to ensure that individuals receive uh, culturally competent, equitable healthcare services. And the last one here talks about how the healthcare systems that enable and support nurses uh, should be tailored to meet specific medical and social needs of diverse populations to optimize their health. Lastly, you know, this provision, uh, re uh, recommendation nine, I know a lot of us are sifting through this 500 plus page report still, but it talks about how, uh, it talks directly uh, about the need to really instill in the NIH a lot of these uh, specific agendas to develop and support a research agenda in evidence base, uh, describing the impact of nursing intervention. So NINR um, has been around, you know, our main way of, of, of funneling this through, through nursing and has been a great boom. But even given the history of the National Institute for Nursing, Nursing Research, which I briefly have here, I point out a few things. You know, the funding has increased over the years as it should, but you know, I don't think any of us on this call will ever say that there's enough money or that we can't use more money, yes? Yes? So um, that being the case, I just wanna point out a couple of things. Since the inception of NINR, all of the directors of NINR have been white women. This speaks to the lack of what I think of as inclusive leadership. Uh, inclusion, having a seat at the table matters uh, when you start making some uh, administrative decisions and uh, having other collective voices. And the funding that has consistently gone up has never really prioritized or considered a proactive anti-racist research agenda. The history of, of nursing is often told from a white uh, Eurocentric perspective. We don't really talk about the contributions of, of Black and other people of color nurses more. Uh, this website, The Nurses You Should Know, was something that I was working with some colleagues earlier this year that we launched on February 1st, the beginning of Black History Month, that really is, is trying to put out uh, some other narratives around the contributions of nurses 
uh, from uh, Black and BIPOC communities. So how to be an anti-racist in, in nursing research? What do we, what, here's the to-dos. We need to teach a more inclusive and diverse version of nursing history. Uh, we need to teach about the contributions of other, other uh, segments. Avoid teaching that very narrow perspective of nursing history. We need to diversify NINR and prioritize inclusive anti-racist research. And I'm talking about leadership, funding priorities, strategic planning, uh, review panels. Think about setting mandatory diversity and inclusion criteria and sampling and recruiting methodologies. We need to consider the use of critical race theory as a framework for research projects, no matter what uh, the recent talk about critical race theory is in the popular media, which is a mischaracterization of the paradigm, which is really used to investigate root causes of health disparities, because uh, it's based on race equity and social justice principles and as community-based uh, participatory approaches. We need to think about how do we infuse DEI and social health justice principles into nursing practicum or practical courses at all levels. We need to think about establishing nursing research postdocs with an anti-racist restorative justice objectives focused on healthcare disparities. That is sort of putting your money where your mouth is in terms of uh, support. So some last take home points, uh, racism in the United States exists and persists. Health disparities in BIPOC people very much still persist that needs to be addressed. Uh, COVID-19 was, as an exemplar, uh, revealed the extent of some of these healthcare disparities. Nursing still plays a very critical, important part of the healthcare system that impacts health disparities. Hence, nursing can be part of the solution and should be part of the solution. Past medical research atrocities equal medical mistrust that must be addressed before we can establish an anti-racist research agenda. Conducting anti-racist research will help us achieve health equity. I don't think we will ever achieve health equity without uh, uh, addressing uh, how do we do this through anti-racist research approaches. Nursing is in a unique position to put forth this anti-racist research agenda. And there are many things that can be done. I just gave you a few exemplars. Um, uh, thank you for the opportunity to discuss. I hide in public. Uh, always welcome to have conversations and I will stay for the discussion. Thank you so much, Dr. Fields. Um, I'd now like to welcome our second speaker, uh, Dr. Nicole Redmond. Dr. Redmond is a board certified internal medicine physician who completed her MD, PhD in the medical science training program at the Medical University of South Carolina in Charleston. She's a program official at NHLBI. Uh, one of Dr. Redmond's research interests is racial, ethnic, and geographic disparities in psychological, socioeconomic, behavioral, and clinical cardiovascular disease factors. She also has an interest in the impact of the criminal justice system on health disparities. So please join me in welcoming uh, Dr. Redmond. Thank you for having me. Are you able to hear me okay? Sometimes I have a little trouble with this headset. Great, let me share my screen. Are you able to, I'm sharing here. I'm not sure you're able to see. Yes, oh, good. we can. Okay, great. All right. So thanks again for the warm welcome. Um, and uh, I'll just move right on through here. Uh, I don't have any uh, disclosures, uh, financial disclosures. And I'd like to acknowledge my colleagues uh, in the Office of Clinical Research at NHLBI, Dr. Gail Pearson and Katie Kavonis, who is our clinical trial specialist who um, manages uh, a lot of the Institute's inclusion, including the compilation of uh, the inclusion reports. And also uh, Dr. Rasuli, who was my uh, contact here and who gave me some uh, feedback on an earlier draft of this presentation. So I'll be talking about why inclusion matters overall, um, touch a little bit on NIH inclusion policies, a history, and some of what I perceive are the challenges to implementation, um, and then cover some touch points that I have as a program official with investigators throughout all phases of the application and award cycle. 
and then end with a few case studies, um, again, based on some experiences I've had that might be uh, useful for further discussion. So first, justice is one of the basic ethical principles for human subjects research. It's the basis for determining how burdens and benefits of research should be distributed. And so I think we need to give some thoughtful consideration to these questions in terms of who the research may impact, who is and isn't included, who benefits versus who's at risk, who participates and who leads research. And so these questions help us evaluate the social and scientific value of these study questions at both the individual and population levels. And we also should consider the representation of the population that's affected by the condition of interest. Uh, this is also important for achieving equity in the public's investment in biomedical research and ultimately is important for achieving equity in health outcomes. Inclusion also matters because we want to do things right. And by doing things right, that means uh, conducting, uh, conducting our investigations with rigor. So the NIH rigor and reproducibility policy defines scientific rigor as a strict application of the scientific method to ensure unbiased and well-controlled experimental design, methodology, analysis, interpretation, and reporting of results. So that means uh, inclusion um, is important to generate results that we can trust, as well as generalizable results that we can use. So diverse perspectives in every part of the uh, scientific process is critical uh, for, for scientific rigor. So next, a little discussion about uh, inclusion policies. So first, and we might have uh, uh, discussed this a little bit previously, is that the, um, in the NIH Revitalization Act of 1993 established inclusion um, uh, guidelines for uh, reporting. Um, and then subsequently for reporting of women and minorities in clinical research. And then subsequently in 2017, it was amended to include a requirement specific for phase three clinical trials to report results um, by subgroups uh, along uh, sex and gender, race and or ethnicity. More recently, we've established uh, inclusion across the, across the lifespan policy, uh, beginning with applications as of January 2019, uh, where we're asking investigators to make all efforts to include uh, uh, all age groups or include reasonable justifications for exclusion, with particular attention to children, those under 18 years, as well as older adults defined as uh, 65 years or older. And then uh, these uh, policies also require NIH level and IC level reporting of inclusion data to Congress. And Dr. Zink shared that data with you for NINR. Um, these uh, initially re required on a biennial basis uh, to uh, report on the overall portfolio of the NIH and the individual institutes along uh, sex, race, and ethnicity um, for all uh, primary data collections. And then with the 21st Century Cures Act in 2016, uh, they transitioned from biennial to triennial reporting, but now we're also requesting um, data according to research condition disease categories or what we call RCDC codes. So some of the challenges that I, uh, I think are most significant to implementing the inclusion policy is the overlap of biologic and social constructs. So first we wanna consider biologic diversity, which includes genes and gene expression, um, which results in various phenotypes. And then there's social diversity. So that could include various uh, uh, dimensions of self-identity, as well as your environment and how those influence your experiences and exposures. And I think ancestry is a really uh, great illustration of this complexity. So ancestry is a, a concept that relies on genomic data, but because geography and migration and mating are also subject to sociopolitical influences, there's also some social elements in an ancestry construct as well. And so um, as, as anyone that's involved with uh, uh, genomic or genetic research knows that race and ethnicity and ancestry have a very complex and intertwined relationship 
And so these demand very nuanced analyses and, and careful interpretation. So some implications of inadequate inclusion are significant. Um, so for example, we know that uh, a lot of the available genomic data um, for in, in, in inclusion in medical research is predominantly based on European ancestry. And so that leaves a very significant amount of worldwide genotypic and phenotypic variation undiscovered or undercharacterized. And this is important because the frequency and effect sizes of genetic variants that might be associated with disease risk may actually vary across populations. And so ultimately, this lack of inclusion might perpetuate the gap in access to precision medicine for those who are not adequately represented in this research. Um, of note, many clinical algorithms have used race correction, likely as a proxy for ancestry in the absence of genomic data. Now, the, uh, the authors of, um, of the uh, genetic ancestry paper argued that maybe self-identified race um, could continue to have utility uh, because of its correlation with uh, geographic ancestry, and so that there could be uh, is suggestive of a measure of variation to um, response to drugs or susceptibility to disease. And also race is potentially a proxy for social determinants of health issues in terms of environment, health behaviors, the impacts of bias and discrimination, comorbidities and treatment seeking behavior um, and, and so on. Um, and so all of these are, are definitely impact health but may not be adequately measured. So one concern with the use of race ethnicity in these models are uh, consideration of the data that were used to generate the models and the lack of inclusion potentially in that data. And if the inclusion versus exclusion of race ethnicity in these clinical algorithms actually end up resulting in worse health, worse health outcomes or potentially exacerbating health disparities. So again, these associations um, with, with some of these complex constructs really need to be interpreted carefully um, and, and have a lot of nuance. So this is just a reminder of the complexity again. I say that there's levels to it. First of all, uh, these uh, two um, uh, figures at the bottom just represent uh, some of the multi-level frameworks that you might be familiar with. The bottom is the social ecological uh, model. The right is the biopsychosocial framework. And then the emphasis on biological and social constructs may actually vary across the research translation spectrum, um, whereas earlier translation may focus a little more heavily on biological constructs. But as you move into clinical effectiveness and implementation type research, uh, you start to consider uh, social constructs much more. And so therefore, from my perspective as a program staff in, in, in supporting investigators, we really have to uh, consider this level of complexity when evaluating um, the, the uh, inclusion um, guidelines. So what are some opportunities uh, where we engage with investigators about uh, uh, meeting inclusion? First, you know, we have a lot of discussion about the significance of study question. Um, you know, a lot of times, you know, we talk about each institute's research priorities, but I think this is also an opportunity to, to consider the value and importance of this question um, and representation of the affected population for this uh, given uh, condition, as well as the existence or not of prior studies um, regarding any sort of uh, demographic differences in health outcomes. Another opportunity is to really have a discussion about the constructs of interest. So a strong theoretical or scientific framework uh, that defines the measures and then being sure that the data collection and analytic approach is appropriate and in alignment with that framework. Um, and specifically, especially for the larger studies as per the inclusion policies, there might need to be some um, plans for subgroup analyses. We also want to have an awareness, again, for um, in particular for our clinical trials, the impact of participant diversity on power. Because if there's variability in um, the outcome measurement or the magnitude of effect size by in groups, that could really have an important impact on, um, on your study design and, and your uh, ability to really address your scientific questions. 
Another issue uh, in study design is the consideration of inclusion and exclusion criteria. Um, according to the policy, exclusions must be due to ethical or scientific reasons. And so some acceptable justifications for exclusion are listed here. Um, of note, cost is not an acceptable exclusion. So this all should be um, scientifically driven. And an important thing to note is that we do recognize, I think I just advanced, um, that there are trade-offs between more narrow eligibility criteria that optimizes result consistency and reduces noise versus more permissive criteria that might allow for diversity but then increases the heterogeneity of results and, and might um, pro, um, um, uh, result in some of the challenges to analysis uh, that, that I discussed previously. Another opportunity to engage and, and think about issues related to inclusion are with regard to study operations. Uh, so that includes site selection. And so I have this figure on the right that shows that for a multi-site study, uh, the different colors represent the different groups and they have all different contributions to the different groups, but that collectively, um, this might be reasonable representation across the four groups when you think about the sites in aggregate. And so something to think about is what is the recruitment path capacity of the, the study site or sites? Um, in addition, thinking about the personnel and their training and cultural concordance with your target population, um, and how that might impact your recruitment and outreach. And I'll take a moment to, to mention that our Office of Research in uh, Women's Health has developed an outreach toolkit on engaging and retaining women in clinical research. But now I'm viewing uh, Dr. Zink's uh, data on the NINR, there might need to be some help in engaging um, your uh, male participants in nursing research. Um, other things to consider are participant burden and to the extent that your study procedures uh, might create uh, disproportionate barriers. So for example, transportation, the number of study visits, the location of the study visits, and how maybe you could uh, uh, address these with maybe technology or home visits or other uh, options that could reduce that burden and increase uh, more equitable uh, engagement in your study. Um, this could also be considered for retention strategies. And all of these, of course, can impact your timeline and study budget. And so that's why you really want to think about these things pre-application so you can plan accordingly um, and within uh, the, the constraints of uh, the particular funding opportunity. So the next opportunity, um, this is a little more limited engagement um, uh, where program staff, but as we can remind you that in the application, particularly for uh, human subjects, there's a specific section in the application that addresses uh, issues around uh, recruitment and inclusion um, across all these demographics, as well as recruitment and retention plan. And so a lot of that pre-application preparation is now uh, manifested in the application. And then a reminder that during the review, uh, program officers are able to uh, observe the review um, and uh, a reminder that reviewers are going to assess the acceptable or unacceptability of your inclusion, recruitment and retention plans. And so any of these inclusion concerns must be resolved prior to the issuance of a notice of award. And so that's when, again, um, program staff are engaged in the post-review pre-award process. That, uh, and this is where we'll have to consider all of those prior, prior considerations uh, to address, um, to, to um, determine if there's some justifications or if there needs to be some um, study modifications or clarification about uh, any of these issues listed here um, that could address the issues in, in um, and make us more comfortable uh, pursuing um, uh, granting the award. Lastly, uh, for post-award monitoring, um, at least at NHLBI, we have a milestone accrual uh, plan or policy uh, where particularly for our larger trials that are of a, a certain size, um, with the number of uh, human subjects uh, participants, so both observational and trials actually, um, we agree on benchmarks ahead of award and then um, continue that monitoring throughout the life of the award. Uh, we have a quarterly accrual monitoring process where we ask investigators to report their overall accrual and track that um, and, and benchmark their accrual based on the time points within the study. 
Um, and then if they go below those uh, time points, uh, those uh, accruals, so say they've dropped below 50, 75, 50, or 25% of accrual, um, you know, below what's expected for the time in the study, that's an opportunity to, to do some course correction, engage with the investigator about ways to mitigate those issues before uh, we get too far along. And of course, there's the annual research performance progress report. And that's where we focus a little more clearly on the uh, uh, plan versus actual enrollment by inclusion categories and can view uh, when, you know, again, um, try to troubleshoot and mitigate any anticipated issues if we see that there's um, issues with accrual for any uh, of the categories. So now I'll just uh, cover just a few uh, examples of uh, some, some cases that made me think a little bit about how to actually uh, engage uh, investigators with this uh, accrual policy. Um, I had one um, early career investigator with a pharmacokinetic study um, and the reviewers uh, criticized uh, the lack of uh, diversity uh, in the cohort. And this investigator was uh, frustrated because in a, in a prior submission, the reviewers actually had concerns about the feasibility of this early stage investigator having multiple sites given their early stage. And so they actually scaled back to one site, but that site was a little more racially uh, homogenous. But then as we dug into the science, you know, given the, the focus on pharmacokinetics, you know, the question was, can genetic diversity still be adequate in a racially homogenous cohort when this was very much more of a mechanistic study of, um, of drug response? And so uh, we um, had, uh, I had the investigator get some more information about the, the various variants that uh, were of concern um, and, and um, you know, try to uh, have a full of understanding. But in this case, inclusion strictly based on social constructs of race and ethnicity um, made it a little challenging because really what mattered in this study was ancestry. A second study uh, was focused on black women aged 30 to 45 and some uh, cardiovascular outcomes. And so then reviewers had a little uh, question about this middle age definition and this age limit and if that was well justified. And so there's a lot of conversation around uh, the, the goals of the study. You know, is this person really trying to focus on, say, the, the perimenopause stage, which in and of itself doesn't have a clear clinical criteria, but maybe they might want to have, a, whereas menopause is a little more clearly defined, so maybe menopause could have been an exclusion um, if that was really important. Or are they trying to define middle age by social, so some common life experience. Um, a lot of places where we see an age exclusion is program eligibility, for example, for Medicare. So if you're going to be Medicare eligible, you have to be a certain age. Um, and so that also, you know, impacts your access to insurance or healthcare access and such. And, you know, maybe there was some prior data. Uh, and I think that was, you know, the investigator, you know, had done studies with this age group. And so was that enough justification to kind of just focus on an age group, but maybe considering other ways to, to think about inclusion and exclusion given the, the framework uh, that um, was being uh, studied. And lastly, um, some of you may have seen this. This is from um, the Moderna uh, Cove study to examine um, the efficacy of uh, their vaccine. Um, and so what this shows is their enrollment, the red bars are uh, white participants, blue bars of non-white participants. And so they actually near the end of the study actually closed trial sites that were doing a poor job of um, in enrolling people of color and extended the study timeline to allow for additional enrollment. So now had this been a clinical trial in my portfolio, I imagine the discussion that staff were having were, you know, do you have the, the resources in terms of money and time to make these adjustments and course correct mid study? Or, you know, if things had been too far gone, would we just close out the study and, and say, hey, we're just not meeting our, inc our inclusion enrollment. Um, and so we have some issues there. So just a reminder that there's a a lot of resources online for both investigators and program staff. Um, and there are some other external resources. Um, I did um, use uh, some of the, the, the 
points from um, this multi-regional uh, clinical trials uh, uh, center that's at Brigham and Women's Hospital, and they've done a great series going in depth to a lot of issues around inclusion. Um, so it's very excellent and the recordings are available. Um, and then also noting that uh, the FDA has uh, focused more on enhancing diversity of clinical trial populations and has um, some guidance focused on industry uh, as well that could be informative uh, for this work. And with that, um, I'll be happy to uh, take any questions and participate in the discussion. Terrific. Um, wonderful presentations. Thank you so much. A lot for us to think about and hopefully a lot for council to discuss here. Um, I, let's see, I have asked Dr. Johnson to lead the discussion here. So I will turn it over to you. Great, thank you. Uh, thank you uh, both Dr. Fields and Dr. Redmond. That was great to hear uh, both an extramural and an intramural uh, perspective on inclusion in research. And it, it got me wondering, um, sort of hypothetically, if, if this were an imaginary world where you weren't constrained by, uh, by budgets, policies, and politics, um, what might the NIH in general and NINR specifically do uh, that could be bold and transformative to improve, to address problems with uh, inclusion in studies, but more broadly uh, to, toward the end of improving health equity in the populations that we're, important, we're interested in um, understanding? So what, what from where you sit, if there were no limits, what bold and transformative actions could should be taken now? Okay, and so either. Oh, I'll I'll take a stab at it. Um, because if somebody wants to give me unlimited resources and the ability to make to wave a magic wand, um, you know, I have always said uh and it's been a mantra, is particularly in HIV research for a long time, that the money should follow the problem. And it never really has. You know, we, we, we know where the problems are. We know where the disparities are. Um, we know where some of the barriers are. We've lacked the uh, will, if you will, to really implement some strategies that will uh, move the mark uh, one, because anytime you talk about uh, being progressive in some of these areas, uh, a lot of people see it as a zero sum game, uh, which means that if I give you uh, extra or if I seem to give you more, that means there's going to be less for me. Um, and, and one, that's very, you know, American capitalist way of looking at it. Uh, and it's reductionist and it doesn't help. Um, Again, we need to start talking about uh, and infusing language of anti-racism, in, in my opinion. It's not uh, diversity, equity, inclusion, uh, make people feel better. Uh, it's a little fluffy, uh, but it really doesn't get at the nature of the problem. You know, there are racist policies that, uh, even form the whole application process to NINR or, or any other NIH institute. Uh, Dr. Lowe uh, mentioned a, a part of this when he talked about you know, the timeframes given to respond to some of these grant proposals. Well, you know, it's based on, a, on, on mainly a, a, a Western white uh, perspective of time. Um, you know, and, and I know why NIH does these, you know, you know, we'll put it out there, we'll do a 30 day turnaround. This way, you know, uh, we won't get uh, uh, too many applications, we'll get enough. But the problem is, is you're not getting all that you could get. Um, and I, I really, the process itself, uh, again, is, is a racist process. And, and when you start using words like racist and anti-racist, you know, people get into their feelings because, you know, a lot of people automatically go, but I'm a good person and I'm not a racist. No, that's probably the case, but it doesn't mean that you, you, you are not operating within racist policy structures. Um, um, so let's start there. That's one. Um, and really start 
talking about multiculturalism from the standpoint of the fact that if we, if we include more people uh, in different ideas, we all are going to benefit. It, it, it's not just a black versus white endeavor. It's us versus them. Uh, and, and what I mean by that is those of us who are thinking in anti-racist paradigms versus those that are stuck in racist paradigms that have historically benefited them. Uh, so um, if we begin with that type of structure, then we can start adding initiatives that move forward that agenda. So I'll stop there for now. I was, uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Fields and Dr. Redmond, uh, Nena Peragado Montano, I'm from University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Um, I was shocked by the, the numbers representing Latino populations. Uh, they're not, you know, almost half of the population is represented. Uh, and it's similar in the nursing workforce. But the other issue with the Latino population is the inclusion criteria. For most studies, you have to read and write in English. I mean, there's a, a, a large portion of the population that might not be able to do that. And yet they may be the most marginalized and with least access to healthcare. So, you know, how, what does NIH and NINR do to, to be able to capture, you know, research data, you know, from, from these portion, large portion of the population, and how do we ensure that we have enough representation? And, and part, of what, part of what you just said underscores my very same point, that, that, that requirement of English is a racist policy. Whether you see it that way or not, that's what it is. And I, this is Joanne Wolf. Thank you both for, for very stimulating discussions. Um, just to add to that, um, I heard Dr. Redman you say that it, you can't you, you you can't say that it's a matter of budgetary constraints, for example, to not be able to uh, include Spanish-speaking patients. Um, to me, I feel like if there are that there should be budgetary opportunities to expand your methodology so that you can include um, non-English speaking patients um, in your studies. And so uh, sometimes I feel like our, our, you know, we're, we're, our hands are tied. Um, and I wonder what your thoughts are about that. You know, I think uh, addressing um, the appropriateness of the science given resource constraints, whether that's uh, the institutional constraints, the strengths of the investigator's own network and knowledge, um, you know, are all really challenging. And I think that's, um, you know, I was uh, just reflecting on some of the prior comments uh, that, you know, a lot of this has to start before the application is really submitted. So to the degree that the investigator is engaging with colleagues and collaborators to think creatively um, about how to address this issue or planning studies. And so that maybe you can't address everything in one study, but knowing uh, intentionally what the gaps are and setting it up where subsequent studies could then pick up where that left off. Um, uh, you know, I think it's very challenging. We get very excited about our science and really try to include about 30 projects in one application. <laughs> um, I see that a lot. So um, it might be a matter of, of just scaling. Um, and then I think also as reviewers, um, really investigators have the, you know, the reviewers have the opportunity to provide this kind of feedback and, and suggestions um, on, on ways to, to address this. But I think, you know, I'm, I'm also a big proponent of policies and processes, you know, to the extent that we can um, have, you know, there are investigators that do it well. Well, what are they doing? How can we disseminate those best practices uh, more effectively? Um, so I do think there's some opportunities um, to, to support that um, in, in, you know, um, and it's not just a function of where, where the people are, although that helps a lot, but there, there's, 
you know, a, a growing amount of, of literature and it might take getting out of your discipline a bit to see, well, maybe there are some cancer trial studies or maybe there's some other studies that at least from a process standpoint have a, a, a way of addressing these issues more um, effectively in a way that is um, um, reasonable within, within the resource constraints that we have. Thank you both for uh, those great presentations and um, very informative. Um, I'm John Lowe, I'm at the University of Texas at Austin. Um, I think I have a question for each. Um, uh, Dr. Redman, uh, I really appreciated your uh, uh, speaking about uh, policies and processes and, and uh, you know, I guess I would just, comment that, um, you know, those of us who either work with our own communities or other communities of diversity, we can't do that work without uh, their inclusion. So, you know, I can't study my, my tribal community without, you know, the, uh, the people. And so I have to go through lots of different processes and, and to be able to include them and sometimes I think that get that gets lost in that uh, the policies around applications. And um, so I don't know if there's a way to even provide funding um, just to do that piece and then as a catalyst to doing others, because so many times we lose that community, those communities. Uh, because, you know, by the time we do get an application in and they have engaged with us and they're, we, we've um, um, gotten their attention and gotten their excitement and then, you know, we don't get funded. And so um, it's, it's not only demoralizing to the uh, applicant as the investigator, but it's very demoralizing to the community when it repeats time and time again. And so I think if there was something to fill the gap and many times, you know, we reach into our own pool of resources and depending on where you're at, you may have more than others. And so to just to do things to fill that gap and to keep that engagement. So I don't know if there's a way to, um, to provide some resources uh, and maybe some policies that would really look at uh, that process of providing some resources to fill the gap in between. Um, yeah, and I, I think you know what you're getting at reminds me a lot of the discussion around um, community engaged and community based participatory research. Um, that part of that infrastructure building is the building of the relationships and the trust. Um, and that that itself is a resource intensive process. Um, so, you know, I agree, uh, you know, I, I don't, can't say that I know off the top of my head, uh, immediate resources uh, related to that, but I do recognize that as um, a, a potential area to, to think about um, a lot more. And I, and I agree that, especially with the, the issues around the pandemic, um, you know, trust was a huge issue um, as it relates to engagement in clinical trials and then ultimately uptake of, of vaccines and any other therapies that are that are uh, in the pipeline for development um, for the for the management. Um, and so that we're understanding that uh, the importance of this relationship building in uh, trust and engagement. Um, and so I, you know, welcome some additional thoughts and thinking about well, what that looks like, what resources are missing that are actually needed, um, you know, and actually getting uh, concrete about what's reasonable and what time it takes and to the extent that that process could be applicable to a multitude of, of populations. Um, and, and, and so then um, we can enhance engagement across the board. Thank you. And then if I could, I'll ask Dr. Fields, great to see you again, Shelton. Um, I um, I think we all have become aware of the DEI um, uh, positions within schools of nursing and colleges of nursing across the country uh, and other disciplines. And so I'm just 
curious to, to uh, hear your perspective on how that position could be leveraged, especially in nursing with, with uh, NINR, to help to um, 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 advocate and to build the uh, diverse nurse scientists within institutions? Well, thank you for that question, Dr. Lowe. Um, and you're right, nursing um, has finally, uh, I think, become aware that they do not have, uh, for the most part, the expertise and the depth of, of knowledge on their faculties to really lead uh, a DEI uh, initiatives. They really do need specialists such as myself. Um, my position at Penn State College of Nursing is inaugural, as is a lot of, of, of these positions in schools and colleges of nursing, because nursing is also playing catch up. Um, uh, our medical colleagues have had these positions in, in schools of medicine uh, longer than we have. Um, that's because I don't think nursing ever really truly wanted to admit that they really needed help. Um, and it wasn't valued. Now it's being pushed. And a lot of times it's being pushed from higher up. Uh, there's even still some resistance, um, but people are, are being forced to comply because you know, now nobody wants to be seen as, as being uh, uh, a, a racist or being anti-inclusive because it is, not, it is not socially acceptable. Um, but, my role as an associate dean, and, and I'm very clear about this because these roles are not all being placed at the uh, associate dean uh, level. They should be. Uh, as a major uh, head administrator, I'm also the chief diversity officer for the College of Nursing. I liaison across the university with my other colleagues uh, and to connect us directly to the initiatives that are happening at the university level. So we're not operating in silos, uh, which is another thing that nursing has historically done. Nursing has always tried to go in alone and we don't need to do that. Um, but part of my role is to work directly with faculty and that, that includes faculty development. I had a conversation for an hour yesterday as an example, uh, uh, Dr. Lowe, with an incoming new, uh, uh, faculty member that we recruited, uh, tenure track, you know, junior level assistant professor, and she's putting in a, a, um, a K award, and she wanted to talk with me about uh, ensuring that she is including DEI language and initiatives, and, you know, how can she be, uh, how can I assist her with making sure her proposal has those elements in it? So, you know, without me being here, I doubt that that conversation would have happened. So, and that's just a really sort of real world example of something that happened yesterday uh, in, 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 my, in the work that I'm doing. So um, thank you for that question. Um, and and I, I hope uh, uh, everyone here is able to really see the value uh, that I and my other colleagues that are now in these positions and being recruited to these positions can really have. Um, uh, and you know, if you're a dean of a college and a school of nursing out there and you don't have you don't have your own Dr. Fields, I suggest you go find one. Can I, can I ask a question again? Um, I'm really interested in your thoughts, both uh, Dr. Fields and Dr. Redmond, on um, the concept of inclusion criteria, uh, which is obviously something that we're held to with every um, application. Um, I had the privilege of hearing Dr. Otis Browley speak, and um, he was, I, you know, if I got the message correctly, he was talking about how that sort of undermines. Uh, uh, attaining uh, valid results in small populations because you have representation proportionality, proportionately, but that doesn't allow you to form conclusions in uh, amongst diverse populations. And so I'm sort of wondering what your guidance would be if, if I'm um, articulating that correctly. I don't, you know. 
Um, I can take a, a stab at that. So I think I touched on that a little bit about that tension between narrow versus broader, you know, inclusion. And I, I think it's a discussion that's very dependent on the state of the science uh, for that, you know, to the extent have we kind of already figured some stuff out and now need to move on to then be more focused on, um, you know, specific subgroups and then per perhaps oversample, have an overrepresentation so we can do the appropriate subgroup analysis. Or are we at this, the earlier stages where it's still really exploratory, so it might be useful to be a little more broad and, and we're, we're looking for signals. So I, I think it's um, one of the most unsatisfying answers. It depends. Um, and, and that's why it's a conversation. Um, that's why it's a discussion. That's why I encourage uh, broad collaboration and engagement. Uh, one of the things I tell applicants is um, whenever I look at an application, I can pick out the different methods and different types of expertise. And then I try to match that with the, the study team. And so if I see gaps, I was like, you go to go find, make some friends, <laughs> um, phone a friend, find some help, find you a Dr. Fields, <laughs> um, you know, a Dr. Wolf, you know, who has that methodology or subject matter expertise to really fill that gap, to really address the question to help you narrow. Um, so, you know, I think it's challenging. And I think the other thing, again, is sometimes we put all our eggs in one application basket and you really want to frame your study in the broader kind of scientific universe, um, be very clear about where it fits and how it's um, moving the field forward, being clear not only about the, the, the question you're addressing, but the questions you're not able to address, but your intention to move that forward. So I think, you know, we understand constraints, but I think a lot of applicants, especially early career, get focused on what they're doing, but don't think enough about what they're not doing. Um, and that what you're not doing is just as important and you might not do it right now. I say, you know, uh, you, um, you can have it all, but not at the same time. <laughs> and so sometimes it's having an understanding of can done, what you're actually leaving on the table um, and prioritizing, but, but seeing it as a part of a, a, a broader uh, scope of research, either individually for your career or, or more broadly in terms of uh, the, the scientific landscape. Um, and I'll say that I, I think now I, I didn't think as broadly about that when I was in academia because you're so focused on what you have at your institution, your access to resources. But now I think from a program standpoint, um, I encourage people to step a bit back sometimes to think about their study in the context of all the knowledge that's available um, and then to step into it and make those intentional decisions. This has been a terrific discussion. and so much to think about in NINR um, for us and, and we are and we will continue to do so with your, with your support and your help. Uh, we've, we've gotten a little behind again, so we're going to lose our lunch break. But what I would like to suggest again, let's take a uh, 10 minute break so that we can get back here um, roughly at 1.30 to start our strategic plan discussion, which I think will very much um, complement this discussion and the UNITE discussion we had earlier. Uh, Dr. Conway is going to lead us through that. It, um, this has been a terrific uh, council meeting and, and I know it will continue. So again, I'm going to suggest a break till 1.30. I'm turning off my camera. And thank you so much, Dr. Fields and Dr. Redmond for joining us. Very much appreciated your time um, and your expertise. Uh, and we will be talking with you more, I know here at the Institute at NIR. Thank you, it's my Thank pleasure. Thank you all, and see you in a few Redman. minutes. Dr. Fields. Welcome back after that extremely short break. Thank you for um, bearing with us. Um, so let's go on to our next agenda item. Um, a working group council was appointed last summer and fall to advise on the development of NINR's next strategic plan. The working group was co-chaired by Dr. Yvette Conley and Dr. John Grayson. So I'll turn the agenda over to them to present the working group's report. Thanks, Shannon. I'll, let me just share my screen here quickly. Hopefully everyone can see that. 
So it's great to have the opportunity to talk with all of you today about the work of the uh, Strategic Plan Working Group. Uh, as a reminder, uh, like Shannon just said, this working group was assembled last fall under the auspices of this council, and we were asked to produce a report with recommendations about future directions of NINR research. Uh, today, the group's report and recommendations are being formally presented to the council. And before Dr. Conley presents the actual recommendations from the report, uh, I wanted to quickly talk to you about how we got to this point. So here's the roster of the working group. And our goal in putting this group together was to gather a broad range of perspectives from both inside and outside of nursing science with a wide range of expertise. Uh, some of the members have been longtime uh, NINR grantees. Some of them have never been funded by NINR and some of them were from outside of academia. Uh, we ended up with a rather large group as you can see here, but uh, what an impressive group it was uh, with the exception of myself. Uh, I had the honor of co-chairing this group with Dr. Conley. Uh, this council was represented on the group by Drs. Conley, Moore, and Lee. And these individuals were, um, all these group members were everything you could hope for in a working group, uh, dedicating many hours of their very busy schedules to attending meetings and contributing to various homework assignments between the meetings. And at the meetings, uh, they came with so many great ideas and uh, the dialogue between the members was absolutely fascinating. And I know we all could have just listened uh, to these folks talk for, for hours on end. We really can't thank them all enough for their enthusiasm, enthusiasm and their dedication. And I want to especially thank my co-chair, Dr. Conley, for serving in that role and for being just a fantastic partner throughout this process. Uh, Dr. Catherine Tamora from my office was the executive secretary of the group, did a great job. Thanks, Catherine. And a few others from NINR, uh, Drs. Yvonne Bryan, Rebecca Hawes, and Martha Matoka also attended the group meetings to help capture the conversations. And I also want to acknowledge Marie Rowland and her team from Right Brain, who we contracted with to help us with all aspects of the group, including capturing excessive or extensive <laughs> notes from all of the group's discussions, helping us plan the meetings, managing the various questionnaires, and, uh, and then condensing all of that uh, all of those ideas and feedbacks into the report. Um, and Janae Monroe served as the facilitator of many of the meetings, and she also did a great job. This was truly a team effort. So the working group met for the first time back in November. We met about every two weeks after that, uh, interrupted by holidays and other events. Dr. Zank attended the first meeting to formally charge the working group with identifying strengths, limitations, challenges, and opportunities in nursing science, and providing recommendations to the council that will help inform the development of the next NINR strategic plan. Aside from that, however, uh, NINR leadership was not involved in any of the working group's discussions and until very recently had no knowledge of the group's deliberations. Um, this is very much a product of the, uh, of the working group itself. The working group met from uh, November through May. Uh, most of the meetings utilized breakout rooms because of the size of the group. We wanted to make sure everyone had the opportunity to speak and there were surveys and other work between the meetings. And the result was the report that you'll be discussing today. There are a few principles we asked the group to abide by. Most importantly, we wanted them to think boldly and to think differently as they considered the future directions of NINR science. Uh, no research areas were off limits. We also asked them to welcome change and new opportunities and to think about research areas where NINR supported science could have significant and immediate impact. These are the principles that we at NINR are using in thinking about the next plan and the working group, I think, really took these principles to heart in conducting their business. The framework that uh, Dr. Conley will present in a couple of minutes consists of goals, objectives, and strategies. And by goals, we mean broad statements of strategic direction towards uh, which NINR aims. Um, there are three goals in that you'll be hearing about today. Um, objectives are measurable steps NINR can take towards achieving the goals. Strategies are the methods, tools, and activities required to support the objectives. Uh, and importantly, I should also note that consensus was not necessarily the goal of the working group. Our primary goal was to capture everyone's ideas. Fortunately, in the end, there was general agreement among the group on the overall directions in the report. Not everyone agreed with, uh, with everything, and that's okay. 
Uh, hopefully we managed to capture at least the, uh, the essence of everyone's ideas and contributions. You'll note that there's a lot of words in the final report. We wanted to make sure um, we, uh, we got all the ideas down. But even if um, there are some contributions that didn't end up in the final report, um, we have uh, the, the notes from all the meetings and we'll have those as a resource as we move forward. I should also add that this report uh, will be posted on our website uh, a few days after this meeting. And while I'm at it, I'll talk a little bit about, so what's next uh, after today's discussion? Um, how do we get to the actual strategic plan? Um, it's important to note that while the working group's report will serve as a, as a va very valuable source of input into the plan, it's just one source. It's a very important source, it's, but it's not the strategic plan. Moving forward, we'll combine the input from the working group with feedback that we've been capturing from, from other sources as well, including public feedback we've received through our website. Um, we've already received a lot of great feedback that way, and thanks to everyone who has contributed. If you haven't yet, please feel free to keep sending us ideas, NINR strategic plan at mail.nih.gov. Uh, we received a lot of interesting feedback from the What Does Nursing Research Mean to You write-in campaign that we conducted last year as part of the year of the nurse. And of course, um, uh, input from NINR staff, our colleagues at NIH, external stakeholders, and many others will continue to uh, inform our thinking. And so without further ado, I will be quiet, and I will now turn this over to Dr. Conley. Okay, let me share. Okay. Can any, can everybody see my slides? Are they up? Yes. Okay. Um, let me just, I, are they showing in presenter form? Are they okay or? No. Yeah, I'm trying to get the, ah, okay, there. It's, it took off on me. Okay. Um, okay, I'm done. No. <laughs> Okay, so thanks, thanks, John, for the um, the introduction, and um, I will echo John's comments about um, just uh, what a fantastic group of folks to work with, um, you know, d during this uh, um, working group. Uh, I think we all learned a lot, and and I just um, I think we all um, enjoyed the journey. Um, okay, so to look at the organization of, of um, what our journey ended up looking like, we came up with this framework um, that is, is a way to organize the, the thoughts that our um, working group came up with as a, a form of um, advice to Dr. Zank and NINR as they, they um, move forward with developing their strategic plan. And we we're able to organize our thoughts and our advice into three main goals. Goal one being, um, you know, that nursing science will focus on dismantling structures that perpetuate racism and impede health equity. Um, goal two, use nursing uh, science's multi-level perspective to develop and implement interventions to address the social determinants of health across the lifespan. And then goal three um, captures a lot of the research priorities and cross-cutting themes that the working group came up with um, uh, and, and but wasn't represented in goal one and two. And uh, that's how we organized goal three, which is, you know, to use nursing sciences, holistic approaches to advance um, precision health and to advance healthcare across the lifespan. And so I think as we move through some of these, these thoughts, um, it'll, you know, I think that the the presentations this morning from um, Dr. Drs. Bernard and and Drs. Field and uh, Redmond, um, you know that 
you know, they kind of set the stage for um, this discussion, which is quite nice. So I, I'm not going to go into, you know, granular detail about a lot of the words that are in the framework, because I know um, Council has that document, but I did want to um, give a few exemplars of how the working group thought that we could accomplish some of these things so that you know, kind of have an idea of our thought process. So um, under goal one, nursing science will focus on dismantling structures that perpetuate racism and impede health equity. Um, objective one, um, you know, to identify components of structural racism that impact patient care and health outcomes. You know, some of the ways that the working group thought that we could address this objective were, um, you know, to use systems modeling approaches um, from the molecular to the structural level to capture impact of systemic racism on health and health outcomes, including historic, you know, the historical processes and policies um, that need to be impacted. Um, determine mechanisms that explain how structural racism, perceived racism, and discrimination affect health, health outcomes across the lifespan. Um, and during life transitions and across generational transitions. Um, conduct social ecological analyses to capture the underlying processes of structural racism that impact health outcomes. Um, and then when we move on to objective, um, to the second objective, um, develop, test, and implement multi-level interventions that work towards dismantling racism and enhancing health equity in, in nursing care. Um, you know, I, you know, some of the thoughts that the planning group had were, you know, to identify structures across multiple levels that reinforce racism and discrimination and develop, study, and implement interventions that dismantle those structures across practices, across programs, and across policies. Um, examine the biological mechanisms that are affected by structural racism and discrimination. Prioritize interventions that reject the reinforcement of implicit bias and or place responsibility for adherence on the individual rather than the um, impeding structures. And then objective three, to promote equitable access to healthcare and health information. Um, some of the ways that the planning group thought that we could address this objective was, you know, to determine the conditions necessary for historically excluded populations to have equitable access to healthcare information and to healthcare services. Advance health literacy through research and technology that supports equitable access to health education, health screening, and health treatment. Okay. The strategies that our planning group came up with um, were to cultivate trust, increase diversity, ensure equity, and promote practical methodology. Um, and I think a lot of um, some of the things that were discussed in the presentations earlier today um, actually help uh, build those strategies. Um, and I will say a lot of the um, uh, the uh, working group. Um, one of the things about cultivating trust was getting out there into the communities um, of, of historically excluded populations and to understand their specific needs, barriers to health care, um, and facilitators uh, for um, community engaged care. And to commit to diverse representation in decision making and leadership roles across healthcare and research communities. Um, recruiting a diverse workforce of scientists um, that are conducting research relevant to nursing practice. Um, and to prioritize minority individuals in key leadership and principal and, and in principal investigator roles. Um, fund opportunity uh, announcements that um, encourage all grant proposals to describe how that uh, proposed research will address and advance health equity and contribute to the dismantling of structural racism. Establish study sections with diverse representation and expertise in diversity, structural racism, and health equity. 
and to provide common data elements um, and reliable validated tools for data collection um, and ensure that terms regarding equity are clear, operational, and facilitate comparisons of findings across studies. And um, to create uh, novel paradigms to capture and analyze the complexities of structural racism and intersectionality and uh, translate this knowledge into interventions to improve patient-centered health outcomes and to support practice-based evidence research through researcher-practitioner relationships. And I think having relationships and um, between practitioners and researchers and to also um, uh, prioritize this uh, um, uh, team science um, that incorporates uh, a lot of the aspects of what needs to happen if we are to achieve goal, the, goal number one, um, expanding our research teams to make sure that we have that um, content and methodologic expertise was echoed by the, um, the working group. Goal two, use nursing science's multi-level perspective to develop and implement interventions to address the social determinants of health across the lifespan. So the first objective under this goal, identify upstream social determinants that impact health outcomes across the lifespan. And the working group thought that some exemplars of how we might be able to address the first objective um, was to identify the upstream factors um, at the structural level and as well as the population level. Um, things such as policies, functions, services, um, the built and physical environments, um, in, environments that include um, climate change, behaviors, epigenetics, and social genomics that impact health outcomes. Um, and with objective two, develop, test, and implement interventions to address social determinants of health that impede health equity. And the group thought that some of the ways that we could address this objective were to um, develop, rigorous, rigorously study, and implement culturally responsive interventions that address the impact of social determinants of health on uptake, utilization, and health outcomes across the lifespan, and that foster health-making decisions, or um, um, healthy decision-making. Um, Use lessons learned about health disparities from the COVID-19 pandemic to develop, to develop improved culturally responsive strategies for responding to future health crises. Evaluate intervention effectiveness on reducing the impact of social determinants of health and improving health outcomes. Objective three, identify barriers and facilitators to decision-making among different populations. So some of the ways that the group thought that we could address this objective was um, to identify those barriers and facilitators and conduct the research needed to, to identify those, um, those things um, related to health and healthcare, and then focusing on all historically excluded or underserved populations. Identify the unique factors related to how different communities experience um, risk assess health care and make decisions about their health and health care. Use decision science to contribute to understanding the behavioral, environmental, and biological influences on health that impact nursing practice and health outcomes. And to focus on critical trans transitions in life to understand the roots of behavioral change, decision-making, self-management, access to care, and its impact on health and health outcomes. And then objective four, develop targeted interventions from a socio-ecological and biobehavioral framework. And so um, some of the ways that the group thought that we could address um, objective four was to identify the mechanisms that link social determinants of health to health-related outcomes and to um, aid in the development, testing, and implementation of ev evidence-based multi-level interventions develop and rigorously study and implement multi-level interventions that target the individual, family, and social supports, community, population, and policy across the lifespan. Develop, rigorously study, and test intervention strategies that address barriers and facilitators to health, um, as well as access to healthcare, 
um, particularly focusing on historically excluded or underserved populations. Strategies that the group um, felt would help us address goal number two were to foster community-based participatory partnerships and to strengthen innovative methods. And some of the ways that we thought that we could um, help with these strategies would be to, again, develop common data elements for social determinants of health and ensure researchers have access to data repositories. So there was a common theme that um, folks felt that we needed to have um, development of common data elements that address um, goal number one and goal number two so that folks are utilizing these common data elements that allow us to look across studies um, and be able to um, come up with some conclusions that are based on potentially larger sample sizes, for example. Um, ensure that research includes the collection of social determinants of health data from the micro to the macro level and that um, this, the, the collection of social determinants of health data is incorporated into review criteria across significance, innovation, and approach. Um, whether or not a proposal accounts for and measures social determinants of health should be part of the review process. And we want to um, uh, the strategies to um, support research and data collection that represents and addresses inequalities in small populations as well. Goal three, um, using uh, nursing scientists holistic approaches to advance precision health and advance healthcare across the lifespan. So um, when we think about uh, objective uh, one for goal three, foster research that harnesses holistic approaches across the lifespan. Um, here, some of the ways that the group thought that we could address this objective would be to um, promote um, research that looks at interactions between social, environmental, biologic, lifestyle, social determinants of health, economic factors that contribute to health, health care use, and health behaviors. Um, so to have a um, research that um, fosters and encourages inclusion of these, um, uh, of a mix of these uh, types of data. Apply holistic, culturally appropriate approaches to the management and prevention of chronic conditions and develop and rigorously test health management approaches that include the individual population level perspectives, preferences, goals, culture, and values that influence health, health care, and health behaviors. Objective two, apply a syndemics perspective perspective for improving the management of chronic conditions and associated symptoms. So here, uh, when we think about syndemics, what we're thinking about is that synergistic interaction of multiple conditions, social, biological, environmental, and economic factors. So evolve symptom management from a single disease perspective to a perspective of multiple chronic conditions was one of the um, exemplar ways that the group felt that we could address um, objective two. Other ways that we, we thought we could um, address objective two was to study the interaction of biological, behavioral, and environmental mechanisms impacting symptom manifestations and management to develop interventions that positively impact individual and group level experiences of symptoms. Develop and rigorously test symptom frameworks that move away from disease specific models of care and self management and advance mechanistic underpinning, underpinnings of co occurring symptoms across multiple chronic conditions. Develop, rigorously test, and implement long-term strategies for symptom control, complications, and comorbidities of complex conditions. And this would include um, uh, survivors of COVID-19. Develop, rigorously test, and implement multi-level interventions targeted to the management of multiple chronic conditions and syndemics. Identify mechanisms and biomarkers of alterations in health and associated symptoms and develop, rigorously test and implement multi-level interventions and mechanistically targeted strategies for improving clinical care, health outcomes and health equity. 
goal three to promote strategies to enhance health and well-being. The group thought that we could address this objective um, by you know, moving towards the perspective of effective management of multiple chronic conditions um, and, and complete physical, mental, and social well-being by promoting strength and resiliency at every level of the socio-ecological model. Study the milestones and transitions across the lifespan that influence the trajectory of health and wellness. Identify, rigorously test, and intervene upon the milestones, transitions, and impact of social injustices across the lifespan that influence the trajectory of health and wellness in individuals, families, and communities. And the group did feel that we should be addressing um, and identifying factors that contribute to nurse wellness and development um, and develop uh, rigorously test and implement interventions that support nurse well-being. Objective four, support transdisciplinary approaches to palliative and end-of-life care. The group thought that we could address this objective by identifying and addressing the physical, psychosocial, psychological, spiritual, and social needs of individuals and families, and to foster those holistic approaches to palliative and end-of-life care across the lifespan. Prioritize research on health literacy, coping, decision-making, self-management, and care coordination in serious illness, including intervention development, testing, and implementation. Identify and rigorously test the mechanisms of multi-level palliative care interventions in order to optimize effectiveness, efficiency, cost, scalability, and equity. Conduct longitudinal cohort and big data studies to examine the natural and, and treated history of COVID-19 towards advancing palliative and end-of-life care. And the strategies that the group thought we could use to address these objectives and this goal are to promote transdisciplinary team science, cultivate key partnerships partnerships, and advance translation and implementation. And some of the ways we thought um, that these strategies could be implemented would be to provide nurse-led training and teaming opportunities to promote transdisciplinary team science um, and partnerships across NIH, industry, um, and communities to conduct research addressing complex health and healthcare issues through bold, innovative scientific approaches. Foster partnerships among scientists that promote and accelerate deployment and adaptation of interventions across the lifespan. Advocate for representation of nurse scientists in NIH-led advisory boards, communities, and work groups to enhance research translation um, and nursing practices. Engage and partner with individuals, families, clinicians, and communities, particularly those from historically excluded populations, in all aspects of research design, execution, and dissemination of interventions and implementation of new models of healthcare. Partner with different public and private agencies towards transdisciplinary strategies to deliver and foster person-centered precision and holistic health care. Partner with government and private entities to accelerate research uptake and dissemination at the population health level. Foster dissemination and implementation of evidence-based interventions in a socially just way to promote health equity at a population level and to support practice-based evidence through research, um, research through researcher-practitioner partnerships. Um, and so I think the working group tried to um, capitalize on those characteristics of nurse scientists and, um, and, and practicing nurses that um, um, really could be captured that uniqueness could be captured and that lens and, and um, could be captured and applied in ways that, um, you know, maybe some other institutes or centers might not be able to um, uh, do these things because um, NINR has some unique characteristics um, and we hope that we reflected those unique characteristics in the thoughts um, for the strategic plan. Um, some of the um, questions that we came up with to sort of get us, you know, maybe thinking about some of this, um, but I also wanted to say that I think our group was hoping that we could have um, not so much 
wordsmithing thoughts, but um, ways um, to um, offer Dr. Zank and NINR additional advice um, uh, based on this, the, the framework that we just presented. So I appreciate your time and um, I will stop my share. Thank you, Dr. Connolly. So I have asked um, Dr. Elias Ravino Vasquez to help lead our discussion. I would also like to say Dr. Conley and uh, Dr. Kaimor and Dr. Lee were your representatives on this working group. And I would love for them to chime in on in anything they would like to as well. So Eli, I am going to- All Right. Thank you, Sue. There you are. There I am. Thank you, Sue. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Conley, uh, Dr. Garrison, Lee, and more for your contributions to the group. And I totally agree that work group was very impressive. So thank you for all of your work. So as Dr. Conley showed uh, some of the questions to start the discussion uh, of this portion of uh, our meeting. So do these goals and uh, objectives capture the future of nursing science and are there any major themes that you felt were missing as uh, they were presented? I'll start there. Oh, thank you so much for all your work. Uh, as a researcher working with a culturally tailored intervention to decrease the racial and ethnic disparities, I'm so excited about the goals one and two. And uh, th that is really needed. But my minor concern is uh, for goals in one and two, what would be different from the NIMHD priorities except that we uh, focus on nursing science? I'll, I'll, I'll say a little something about that. And I actually think that this was something that came up in our working group. Um, you know, as we were moving through some of these discussions. And I think we kept coming back to the idea that, and, and some of this was presented earlier today, those opportunities that um, uh, uh, nurses and, and, and nurse scientists and people who are, are um, supported by NINR to conduct research that impacts nursing practice, um, that there could be a different lens, there could be a different, there could be different opportunities um, you know, that are there, um, you know, that could be, make NINR unique with goal one and goal, goal two, that wouldn't necessarily be um, a, an overlap with, with um, you know, with, with what um, Minority Health is trying to accomplish at their institute and center. Um, but I do know that this was part of the conversation that our working group had um, quite often was, you know, how, how to make things unique for NINR. And of course, one of the things that we kind of came away with was we were there to provide advice, um, you know, uh, um, to talk about, you know, where, where the future of, uh, where, should, where we should, should we be going? what envelopes should we be pushing? Um, and um, and I think at the end of the day, we kind of thought, here's our advice. Um, and INR is going to, I think, also have to, in the development of the strategic plan, take into account how to make it unique to NINR. Um, I don't, John, I don't know if that captured our thoughts or, or Kai or, or Christopher, if you wanted to add anything else, but I know it was, this was also a discussion amongst the working group as well. Yeah, I'll just add, John, I'm sorry, to, I jumped in before you, but um, I, I think it's an important question that the, that the working group had a lot of uh, discernment and dialogue about. And I think some of that, the salient features that you'll see that kind of differentiate what has been proposed here compared with other institutes is really what makes um, nursing a bit of a unique discipline. So a lot of it is um, the holism, a lot of it is the systems thinking, a lot of it is intersectionality, a lot of it is um, you know, helping communities advance themselves, a lot of the advocacy and kind of social justice work that um, arguably should be kind of central tenants to nursing. And then there's the kind of retention of some of the residual strong tenants of nursing science. So there's still self-management focus, there's still prevention focus, there's still emphasis on palliative care, transitions, uh, lifespan approaches is 
is in all of these kind of goals too. So I think those are the ways in which you can see that this um, is unique compared with other disciplines and still carries on like this whole sentiment of nursing as a discipline. Mm -hmm. and, and this is Kai and I just add one thing. It was also that nursing as a leader, um, when we talk about interdisciplinary teams, it was like nursing dis discipline and science being in the lead rather than a member. And so I think we tried to incur and focus on that as well. Oh, thanks for the response. I think all three was clear on the uniqueness of uh, NI and I, but I was not sure about the goals one and two, but thanks. And I, I had a really similar sort of um, response to it. It was it was hard for me to really see where the nursing science was. I, I, I resonate with kind of the goals, but it's the, how does nursing as a scientific discipline contribute to those in a way that makes us uniquely um, positioned. So I, I, I struggled with, with the same thing about, you know, where, where is the nursing science in this particular plan? Yeah. I mean, I guess I'm close to it that I see it written all over goals one and two, and and it's and it's probably something that hasn't received enough attention. Um, but I uh, but I think nursing is in a position to make major advancements in the, in these regards in a way in which it hasn't, but in which we are trusted by the public to make major headway here, but just probably haven't. So I, I think this is also a, a place too where a lot of the writing groups uh, members kind of struggled a little bit, and then eventually came to agreement that the language is, is really here. Uh, but again, I'm, I'm close to it and have been exposed to it for a lot longer. So I think it's implicit. I, I think it might be more explicit if we're gonna make a, a stand um, to, the, to the world about what NINR is and what, the, what we're interested in. So Sheila See, this had a is question. Kind of, oh, sorry. Go I was ahead. just gonna ask if you could give sort of a, example of how we could do that better? Sorry. Um, I, I think maybe building out this idea about the holistic approach to, to, to the health and well-being of people. Um, it, it really, it didn't come across to me that, that um, you know, why, why would nursing be ultimately positioned to lead in these interdisciplinary groups? It's, I think it is around holistic focus and a, around our attention to the way that people respond to their environment and, and, um, and to the social determinants of health. But it, it, it was clear, it was implicit in the, in the goals and the objectives but it didn't pop out to me in a way that if you were talking to someone who was saying, well, why does NINR need money? You know, what would be the unique piece that we would bring forward? Um, well, this is Peter Lewin. Maybe it will be highlighted in the, uh, in the talk of uh, Adi Brennan. I think that the holistic approach is extremely important. Yeah. And uh, I think that uh, uh, she will probably say something about the uh, interaction between the nursing uh, and engineering, which will contribute to development, for instance, of devices which are being used at home. And this is the future of the telemedicine. This is also a future of, uh, of uh, health delivery. So I have a great expectations that this holistic approach will come up. So Sheila was next, uh, and then we'll go to John and Joanne. Hi everybody, this is Sheila Sullivan from the Department of Veterans Affairs. I apologize first of all for my camera not functioning. I have no idea why, <laughs> um, but it's you know technology. So I really wanted to commend the committee for the excellent work that they've done in creating this proposal. Um, perhaps it is all implicit, but, but much like my colleagues, I see nursing imprinted all over this. And perhaps the words that we need to use are things like leverage, 
um, that we can take our status as the most trusted profession because we have access to individuals that other investigators just may not because in many cases we're already there. Um, and obviously I want to encourage all of you all to consider uh, collaborating with the Department of Veterans Affairs as we pull this information to together because we are certainly diverse in terms of nationality. Everyone is represented um, in, in some cases above and beyond the proportion that they are in the general population. So there's that opportunity and I would be more than happy to create connections for you if desired. Thanks. Thank you, Sheila. John? Yes, uh, thank you. And thank you to the group for um, all your hard work. It's very evident in, in uh, what you presented. And um, I'm reflecting on the conversations and the discussions uh, during the biggest part of the day around diversity and inclusion. And so I'm curious if there's a breakdown and how the decision may have been made about the composition of the working, uh, the, the work group itself. And um, so I'm just curious and, and um, I'll just start with an observation that uh, what is not represented and so therefore there's no voice uh, is that there's no Native American or indigenous person on the uh, work group committee. Thank you. Thank you, John. Joanne, and then you're next, Shirley. Uh, do you mean Joanne? Is it Joanne or Joellen? <laughs> jo Joanne. Uh, oh, uh, yeah, yeah I, I have my hand up and sorry, I was- Okay, well, sorry, Joellen. Uh, I was slow to, low, um, to <laughs> unmute, walking in my house with my coffee, sorry. <laughs> Um, so I think it's a phenomenal plan. I'm very excited about uh, all the areas of emphasis and as a palliative care investigator that there continues to be a focus. Um, I'm curious about the, you know, this is sort of maybe very basic that, you know, the definitions, which I assume will be part of this of nursing science and transdisciplinary. Um, those two, we didn't, you, you didn't use the word interdisciplinary or interprofessional. So I'm sort of what, and not to wordsmith either, but wondering about that. And I guess the, the, the sort of, un, uh, the, the actual question underneath it all is that there are areas that NINR focus on from a nursing science perspective that trainees outside of the nursing discipline don't have the opportunity um, to be trained in because they have, they're from other disciplines. So for example, tra uh, K awards for non-nursing scientists. And I didn't know if that came up at all in the discussion of how to define nursing science and who would be eligible um, uh, not, you know, for these opportunities, especially from a training perspective. So I think, um, you know, some of the discussions that were around um, training and building capacity and building capacity um, really did come back around to, um, you know, um, education and training for um, nurse scientists and future nurse scientists. Um, Correct me if I'm wrong, um, other members of the, the working group, I don't know that we expanded much beyond uh, that conversation, but I think it's a, it's a, it's a good point, Joanne. Um, and uh, I think, you know, we can certainly take note of it. Um. And I'll just add, Joanne, too, you know, Thank it, you. it was not part of our charge to define nursing science. I think there was some discussion about that early on, but then um, we just have had to keep, keep coming back to what our charge was for, for this assignment, which was to not mm -hmm. really define it. And I, but I think on the focus of training, it was really more on uh, making sure that the future of nursing is more diverse and more representative. And if we're going to have two major goals focused on equity and that are have mm -hmm. this language that we're talking about scientific teams that also um, are rep more representative and review groups that are more representative and have the skill set and capacity to even evaluate grants that are proposed to address mm -hmm. these. Not even so much that 
they would have to be nurse scientists. So I'm not so sure that we really focused on nurse scientists, ex except to say that we're, we focused on scientists that had the skill set and had this to put forth to advance their science over their career. Thank you, Chris. Uh, Shirley and then Ida after that. Yes. Um, in the nurse, nurse scientist uh, world out there, there's some chatter about concerns that the efforts over the last 10, 15 years to have more biologic markers in our research, um, uh, that, that, that the initiatives there are gonna be lost in this new. I'm assuming that your goal number three about a holistic approach uh, and its impact on precision health um, is a way of saying that you'll incorporate you know, those physical markers, um, um, biologic markers. Am I, am I correct in that? I, I would also th echo that I think goal one and goal two also had, um, you know, some, uh, had the, the spirit of using biology to help understand those mechanistic links between, um, uh, you know, the, you know, structural racism and social determinants of health. Well, how do they impact health outcomes? And so I do think that there's room in goal one and goal two, not just goal three. I think goal three, it might've been a little bit more evident, but um, uh, uh, goals one and two certainly have room for mechanistic research as well. And I think those were um, spelled out a little bit, um, but definitely in goal three, I think um, there's some spirit of trying to carry on some of the, um, the work that, um, that the foundation has been set previously um, by. I think yeah. I have a suggestion that as absolutely NIN, NINR and those of us who are leaders, you know, as we discuss and talk about the strategic plan to our colleagues, that we um, give some of those examples <laughs> about biologic markers. Um, I didn't hear that a lot when I looked at your, your strategies that didn't come through. Mm -hmm. So I'm just going to suggest that um, we pay attention to that because, um, as I said, I've heard a lot of concerns about that. And so I think we could address them. I think it's there, mm -hmm. but um, kind of um, subtle right now. No, I appreciate that too, Shirley. I think the, um, the intent was to include that and make it explicit, but maybe we haven't done that as a firm job of saying that that would be an enduring element of what we propose moving the science forward. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Ida? Yeah, thank you. Thank you. This is Kai. I go by Ida. I go oh, by Kai. Sorry, Kai. Thank you. No <laughs> problem. I also just want to say we struggle a lot with definitions and thought there would need to be a preamble that would clearly explicate uh, definitions, that we didn't get into the weeds about defining some of these key terms, but thought that it would really need to be well expl explicated in a preamble. And maybe that's where we get into some of the biologic marker piece as well and in terms of what we mean by in biology. Thank you. Shirley, did you have your hand up again? This is Joellen. I, I had my hand up. I don't know if you can see it. Go ahead, Joellen. <laughs> I just, I wanna thank you very much for this work. I think it really builds on our nursing research and our history of developing interventions that are culturally tailored and targeted. Um, but I think it's uh, challenging us now to bring in new frameworks and structures, particularly looking at structural racism and some of those things that we have perhaps brought in, but certainly not explicitly. Uh, so I think that's certainly a challenge for, for several of these goals. I also think uh, it, it kind of hints to me a, at a challenge that we need to broaden our interventions beyond all, all of our, the cultural tailoring we've been doing to developing interventions that are not exclusive to one group or another, uh, but that are more generally uh, appropriate or acceptable to, uh, to many different people or cultures. So I, I think I'm really pleased with what I'm seeing here. Thank you. Any other questions, comments? Well, I, I just wanted to add that uh, 
uh, the cultivating key partnerships was very important and how you define that. And I think Chris talked about um, not only uh, staff that run a project, but also PIs, uh, people out in the community, uh, people of diversity being part of the panel, review panel. I think all that is gonna be critical. And going back to Dr. Conley's comment earlier is, how do you build that capacity of underrepresented nurse scientists to do the research out in the communities? Um, and do you have to be a fish to study fish? Uh, I mean, if there's very few Hispanic nurse scientists in this country, and yet uh, the population is almost half, how do you really support that type of work out in those communities? Well, thank you all for this great discussion and for the presentation of the, of the working group report. Um, it, as um, I, I hope you've noted, it is on the electronic council book. Um, as soon as it's 508 compliant and all of that, we will get it up on the NINR website. Um, we do hope that will uh, promote some people to uh, write in to our um, email address and make some comments. Uh, we, we are planning to take in everything that we have, as John said earlier, and start building out what the strategic plan will look like coming back to you in September again, um, hoping to have a framework at that point uh, in the midst of everything else that, that is going on with the end of the year. So thank you again. Thank you to the working group. Um, thank you to Eli. Thank um, to all of the discussions. I see that Dr. Brennan is on. So Shannon, I suggest we we move ahead with the agenda. Okay, excellent. Um, yes, I certainly want to thank um, all the members of the working group for all your hard work over this past six or more months. Um, we certainly appreciate your thoughtfulness and all of your ideas for future directions, um, which will undoubted, undoubtedly um, be really helpful as we take uh, the strategic planning development and next step. So thank you so much. Um, I'm now really happy to introduce Dr. Patty Brennan, uh, who is well known to many of you. Uh, Dr. Brennan is the director of the National Library of Medicine at the NIH. She oversees the world's largest biomedical library. Since becoming director in August of 2016, she has positioned the library to be the hub of biomedical data science at NIH and across the biomedical research enterprise globally. Dr. Brennan holds an appointment as adjunct investigator in the NINR Division of Intramural Research, where she directs the Advanced Visualization Laboratory. So uh, Dr. Brennan and her team are here to give us an update on their research. So uh, thank you, Dr. Brennan, and welcome. Thanks very much, Shannon, and hi, friends who I haven't seen in a long time. Shirley and Kai, it's really nice to get to see you. And those of you that I have only known through your literature, I, I'm delighted for what you have done for nursing and for advancing us. Um, I want to begin um, by introducing Jim Holdneck. Uh, Dr. Holdneck is the, uh, the lead scientist for the ABB, the Advanced Visualization Branch. And we're gonna be doing a tag team presentation today. Um, I'm gonna grab the screen now and um, walk you through what um, I hope is gonna be as exciting for you as it is for those of us um, in the laboratory. Um, I joined the NINR as in intramural research program when I came to the NIH. It's very common for institute and center directors to have a research operation. What's uh, less um, well known is that the research operations can reach out into the community. And so it was perfectly appropriate that my research be situated within the NINR is one of the few institutes that's recognized as having a commitment to the broader community around the world and specifically to understanding how people live in those communities. So our participation there is really quite important. Um, the, the work that we'll be talking about today builds on work that have, has gone in my, across my whole career on understanding the way people manage in their lives and builds, builds on work in particular 
that I was finished doing in my last five years at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, where we began to, to expand our sense of what technologies could be useful to help us understand and improve the health in everyday living beyond the internet. And that's where the advanced visualization came into play. Our plans for this afternoon's presentation is to give about a 30 minute presentation and then have about 15 minutes of conversation and comment from this group. I'm uh, hopeful that we'll be able to go fairly quickly through our presentation, but please don't hesitate to, to wave at me or interrupt if I go too fast. My Philadelphia slur has only been reinforced by my move back from Wisconsin to the East Coast. Um, let me begin by, by reminding you that the purpose of um, understanding how people live is best encapsulated by something that our team for years has called the care between the care. And if you look at the screen in front of you, you see a gray horizontal line, which represents the year and a life of a, any given patient. We're gonna take a patient who has trauma here. The left uh, most image representing an X-ray that the person has had um, following uh, it's a, a car crash, a surgical intervention in the next image to repair the fracture and then recovery, discharge planning with medication management in the next two pictures and then rehabilitation and finally follow up. And it, it, our healthcare system is good enough to be able to make sure that most people are better at the end of that period of time. So this is somewhat of a success story, but I wanna call your attention to the gray lines, the perpendicular lines that represent where a lot of the conversation about patient care, patient information, and certainly my own specialization in nursing informatics has focused. And that's on the skinny little moments that patients participate in the care delivery system as we as professionals know it. And yet they participate in their lives all the way through those white spaces. And the fundamental theme that has guided my research for the last 30 years has been to figure out how to get into the white spaces, how to deliver care between the care and how technology can help us do that. Now, my earlier work, as you know, relied on taking technology to bring nurses into that period of time. Today, I'm gonna to be talking about something rather different, but things that we learned during that those experiments of bringing technology in the home. And that is to understand how people are living in this period of time. Now, I identify three key nursing research challenges in this area. You can identify perhaps more, perhaps unique ones that'll help us better understand our work and work processes. The first is how do we support self-management? Our team discusses a lot about the differences between self-management and self-care because many of the challenges have to do with what does a person want and need to do for himself or herself? That's what we think of as self-care versus what do they need to do as being good members of the healthcare team that is a partner in care and that's self-management. Right now, I, I believe the most important thing that we understand when we move into the community-based and home care experiences is that it must rest on a partnership of the professional knowledge and skills of nurses, physicians, psychiatrists, pharmacists, and the desires, motivations, assets, and attributes of the individual. So I think of this as self-management rather than self-care. And how nurses can support that requires that we understand both components of it. In order to do this, I also believe we need to find creative ways to use emerging technologies to understand behavior and context. It's very well known that patient education experiences, particularly in a clinic setting, particularly under stressful moments, when most of our patient education occurs, does not extend well into the everyday lives of individuals. And yet, those of you who've been involved in any kind of community-based or home care experience know that trying to get into those lives to understand what is it that stimulates or interferes with a person's ability to take care of themselves? What are the behaviors that they evoke in their natural settings as opposed to the ones that appear in our clinical settings are really quite challenging. My teams, my Wisconsin team's earlier work focused a lot on trying to get into those spaces with people. Now we're trying to understand, given what we've learned about that, how can we use emerging technologies to better understand these behaviors? And importantly, how do we isolate, explore, and intervene with these behaviors? We are fundamentally a practice discipline in nursing. So our reason to understand behaviors 
is to be able to support and reinforce them when they're helpful and helpful for the individual. Pardon me, and to, to perhaps remodel them or extinguish them when they're not helpful. So we need to understand how to be how to actually do that. I want to have you join us in a process of thinking in a new way. We want to understand how people translate professional guidance into personal everyday living. And that translation is often shaped by both one's desire to take care of oneself and one's desire to continue behaviors that might have been pleasing or satisfying in the past. We need to understand how to bring these two together. It's important for us to characterize the environment itself as a nursing intervention. We're quite skilled in the biological and social psychological basis of nursing. And we've actually developed some amazingly effective interventions, both from understanding physiology and understanding psychology or somewhat less skilled in understanding and then manipulating the environment as a clinical intervention. And that is a fundamental objective of my work. How can we engage the environment as a partner? And I wanna have you think about the environment broadly. Now we think often about the internal environment of an individual, their psyche, their ability, their physiology. But let's expand that to consider the interpersonal environments of the social spaces where people live, work, and play. And also the physical environments where people live, work, and play. How are the households, the households laid out? What is it about the space that they have that allows for the privacy to enable us to take care of oneself or allows for the connection with others to be able to have the motivation to do so? Are there resources? Is there a sense of safety? Are there supports that individuals can, get, can glean from the home? Every time we send an individual out of a care system into a home system and say, do this, follow that, measure this, take that, we're making presumptions that not only do they have the will, the skill, and the motivation to do this, but also that the environment can support them in doing that. And so our team's work in understanding the physical environment is really quite important to be able to find different ways to complement and augment nursing interventions, as well as deliberately manipulate the environment as an interventional tool. I also what can't speak strong enough for the fourth environment, which is the broader healthcare delivery system environment. Certainly the past year has told us that healthcare can occur in many places even outside of the healthcare building. And so telemedicine, self-management, community engagement, social and public health approaches are in fact part of healthcare. This is a revolutionary time and nurses have the best chance of leveraging it because we're already mindful that people, where people live is a critical place for nursing interventions to occur. The final environment that's important for us to consider is the policy environment. What policies shape or interfere with our ability to take care of people at home? Now, as federal employees, we cannot, we do not set policies, but we can inform policies. So the work we're doing here within the NINR provides a basis for helping to broaden the understanding of where we need to have enabling policies that provide assistance and support, whether it's for rehabbing a house, making sure there's community workers. Now, the third point I want to bring to your attention is probably not all that new for this community, but I want to reinforce that it is kind of new for the NIH. We focus on self-care, what a person does for himself or herself, function, highest levels of well-being as the target of our interventions, and we generally are not disease-focused. Our work has found, as others have found, that focusing on a single disease hypertension or diabetes or cancer or a, a particular injury isn't enough, that people experience their health as an, in, as an integration of these. And so the, the motivating challenges that our lab wants to take on address this issue of self-care function and high level well-being. We're interested in being a demonstration site to figure out what can be understood in vitro and what must be understood in vivo and understanding that balance because virtual spaces that is the thrust of the AVB lab, home care spaces that it was the thrust of my earlier work are complementary, not replicates of each other. And we need to know what can be understood in these different areas. 
And finally, we need to describe the context of microbehaviors because increasingly we've learned from the literature and psychology that it is at the level of microbehaviors rather than full tasks that we can have our best at our best interventions. And yet microbehaviors are really hard to study because environments themselves are constantly changing. So building on work that I did before, building on the, the frankly, the, the inspiration and support of the NIH leadership, we were able to launch the Advanced Visual, Visualization Branch of the National Institute for Nursing Research. On the right-hand side, you see one of our research assistants testing out some of our equipment. We're not building a cave. Some of you know that I had a, a virtual reality cave when I was in Wisconsin. We're not going to build that anymore. We're looking instead to use emerging consumer-grade technologies to bring virtual reality into the nursing research process. So we are a newly formed digital technology research group that's focusing on the real life self-care and self-management of individuals. We are, we are committed to evaluating the usefulness of the inter, of immersive virtual reality technology, IVR, you'll hear us call it, immersive virtual reality technology as a research platform. Immersive virtual reality is an experience using computer generated sound and sight to help an individual experience an alternate space of being. So we allow individuals by stimulating the senses to feel as if they are in another place and use that technology to design and build real world environments to unobtrusively study factors impacting self-care behaviors and the instrumental care activities of daily living. Our goal is to use the IVR environments as an investigational platform. At this point in time, we do not see uses of IVR as a clinical intervention, although there are many, and you'll hear about those in a few minutes. We want to use the IVR space to be able to understand behaviors in contexts that are familiar enough or similar enough to where a person usually lives so that we can actually understand how to decode and take those behaviors apart find points of interventions and build back up to what the individual needs. Our team to do this has a broad range of individuals. You see more pictures on the screen there. We bring talents from nursing, from engineering, from graphics design, from research in clinical and neuropsychology and from statistics, psychometrics and digital test development. We've put together an amazing team of people to be able to design, visualize, enhance and experience these spaces. I'm extraordinarily proud of the work we've done in the time that we've been open at the NIH. We'll give you some more details about some of the logistics of building the lab and making it real. But right now I wanna turn over to Jim Holdnack who is going to be describing some of the work that we're, we're undertaking and where we're going. Um, Jim, I'll control the slides. You let me know when you need to advance them. Okay, um, do you wanna to advance to the next slide? <clears throat> Can everybody hear me okay? Uh, you're just fine. Okay, great. So uh, just a quick background. Um, uh, I am a um, clinical psychologist, neuropsychologist by training. And I did some uh, formal uh, work in neuroimaging as kind of like my first experience. And during that, I found a love of test development because we would create new tests to put in, in, in neuroimaging, um, um, functional neuroimaging. So my whole career has been around test development, especially psychological test development and cognitive test development. So coming here and working with Patty has been an, uh, an amazing opportunity to take those skills that I had in 2D and try to apply them in 3D because it's a totally different experience. Now, VR as a research platform is interesting because VR has been around, oh, probably a good two decades um, and maybe even longer. And one of my first experiences with VR was we were working with an outside group developing what was called a virtual classroom. And it really was completely impractical at that time. And that was back in 2005. But since then, there's been a lot of research showing that VR is a legitimate platform for behavior uh, research. And particularly uh, things like uh, social anxiety. There's some really great programs that a person can present in front of a, a virtual group and learn how to control their anxiety level. Uh, fear of heights, uh, addictions, PTSD, uh, stigma, bias, uh, eating, feeding. And some of that research is happening right here at NIH with one of our colleagues, Dr. Susan Persky. She does work uh, particularly with stigma and bias and eating and feeding. Um, next slide, please. 
So what could you do in VR? Well, you can take people to places that you wouldn't necessarily want to take them in real life. So in this image, this is a, um, a, a platform, or I should say it's, it's kind of a game that's on a platform called Steam. And you can see there's a little plank that hangs out over this, uh, this vista where you stand and you look like you're you know, 50 stories up on a building. Now, I wouldn't want to do that as a therapist, take someone up there and say, hey, go sit there while I treat you for your anxiety. But I could do that in this environment. And it works incredibly well. In fact, uh, fear of heights is one of those things that there's a good solid research base showing how effective VR is. So we know that you can take people to these places and they experience it in a real way. You know, their, their anxiety goes up, their breathing goes up, their pulse goes up, everything associated with the physiological indicators um, increases. Next slide, please. So virtual environments allow us to evaluate self-management behaviors and the impact on, of in, uh, symptoms on daily life. And, and how, do, how do we think about this? So you have common uh, physiological symptoms that go across different disorders. You have common um, activities that individuals have to do, whether it be, you know, shopping, driving, um, taking a bus, uh, doing all these things that people do in their daily life. One of them is medication management. And we know from um, our nursing coordinator, um, our nursing research, um, um, that this is an area where nurses feel that sometimes patients don't have a good grasp of it. So we can take a look at, well, why would individuals have difficulty managing their medication? Another area that is sometimes difficult for, for patients is Dietary compliance. They go to the doctor, oh, you have this medical condition, you have to reduce your sodium or you have to reduce your fat or you have to manage your um, sugars and in a fairly complex way. They get that information and how do, you, how do they apply it? Well, we don't always know. And, it, and there are some challenges to, to these things. One of the things that we became interested in as part of the NINR is this issue of cognitive fatigue because cognitive fatigue uh, it's in part of the broader uh, cognitive and physical fatigue is one of those uh, symptoms that impacts all aspects of daily life. So individuals with uh, either a chronic fatigue syndrome, multiple sclerosis, lupus, any disorder in which fatigue is a common comorbidity, that can impact their ability to perform these individual activities of daily living. Um, what we're interested in that is not just the cognitive side, which is you think about that as, you know, what do I need to complete this task? Well, I need memory. I need, you know, I need to hold information in my head. I need to do calculations. I need to do these things. Those things have been shown to, to be taxing, but really on top of that, there's an emotional factor. So, okay, I'm trying to perform this task and my kid runs in and starts, you know, screaming, yelling, and now I lost track of where I was with sorting my pills or, you know, or I'm at the grocery store and, you know, people are in my way, or, you know, there's all this noise, or there's all these other factors. So these, these environmental factors can exacerbate and contribute significantly to people's experience of these, um, these, these symptoms. Um, and we know also that, you know, individual differences, not only in susceptibility to fatigue, but individual differences in different abilities and experiences so in a shopping environment, one would say, well, I never go shopping, you know, so it's, it's, you know, or rarely go shopping. So it is always fatiguing for me because I never know where I'm going or what I'm doing versus the person who says, yeah, I shop all the time. It's like, you know, no, no problem. I, I could do it with my eyes closed. So the impact of experience, the impact of specific abilities can influence the person's perception. So this is one of our early environments, sorry, next one, slide. And this is a virtual kitchen in which we are having people sort pills into uh, a pill box. And we're not doing it, we're gonna do it in steps. We wanna see each stage say, okay, can people just simply do, you know, take this pill and match it to the proper location? What kind of skills that, that, does that take? And then we might do something more advanced where they have to remember where to put things. And then till we go to a more full blown study where we look at factors that affect their ability to read labels, to put things in the right location. Do they get affected by you know, noise in the environment or other distractions? Next slide, please. 
Now we've kind of settled into this virtual grocery store as one of our first studies because it's, you know, um, and it's an environment that's extremely familiar to people. It's very important for self-care or self-management activities. And one of our uh, things that we can do, and as an experiment, we can control the task and the environment to be able to differentiate, okay, so there's a task of shopping. Okay, there's a lot of visual scanning. There's a lot of memory. There's a lot of things that you have to do in order to shop for, shop for yourself or shop through a list. But what about other factors? What about that shopping day? You go and there's a million people and everybody's in the way. Kids are crying. You know, you go to get something and it's, there's, it's not in the right place. And you have to search all over the store for something you want. So these factors we know from research can contribute to an in, increased sense of frustration, increased sense of needing to control one's behavior and then draining more um, cognitive reserves to control fatigue. So we like this environment as a way to one, evaluate if fatigue has an impact on shopping environment. Two, we wanna examine how the person sort of, um, how we monitor the person to show how their fatigue is expressed. And that could be in how they move, in the judgments they make, uh, how often they have to refer back to their list. Is their, is their memory functioning well? Is it declining? Are they becoming more efficient? Are they becoming less efficient as they go through the store? And then we can understand better what factors might contribute to difficulties in self-management as related to dietary restricted shopping. Next slide, please. Grocery stores are incredibly complex environments. Uh, every time I go into a grocery store now, I just to get, I just, it just shocks me at how visually stimulating it is and how, you know, how many decisions you have to make and how crowded sometimes can be or how poorly laid out is or how well it's laid out. So this is an environment that, that invokes a lot of um, stimulation and there's a lot of room to observe people's behaviors. There's a lot of variability in people's behaviors and how they respond to these environments. So it is an excellent plant platform for us, not just to study cognitive fatigue, but also to study dietary restrictions, uh, to study other aspects of behavior um, that may be relevant to uh, activities of daily living that we have yet to explore. Next slide, please. So dietary restrictions are important because it's often associated with chronic medical conditions. So like I said earlier, you, you, if you have diabetes, you have to monitor your sugar intake. If you have you know, uh, congestive heart failure, you may have to monitor your sodium, sodium levels. Uh, if you're overweight and that's causing you have problems with your heart, then you might need to reduce those uh, on your intake. But it's not as easy as it sounds. So you can have four different, four different labels of the same exact soup with slight variations to each one. So what's the best one for your diet? Is it the you know, low sodium soup for the ready to serve or the one that says 25% less? Well, is 25% less good enough? Maybe it should be 50% less. Well, how do you know? How do you calculate that? What about the healthy request? Is healthy request better than 25% less sodium or is the fat-free the best one for you? So while it sounds intuitive to say, oh, you have to improve your health, or you have to improve your diet, you have to do these different things. Well, I could buy 98% fat-free cream of mushroom and find out that it has 70% more salt or more other factors. So the, the, the concept is that we can identify factors related to how people make decisions um, related to these dietary choices and, and a supermarket is a great place to evaluate that kind of behavior. Next slide, please. So I'm gonna show you a, a short series of videos to kind of give you an idea of where things or how things look in the immersive VR environment. And this is um, our kind of our current grocery store, which is pretty close to, to being ready to roll. This uh, first video is about a minute uh, and I will kind of talk you through as we go. I'm not sure if you'll be able to hear the sound or not because there's music playing and other, it sounds like a grocery store, essentially. Um, uh, Patty, can you run the play? So what you're seeing here is the person has a cell phone and on it, they have a shopping list. And their task in this uh, environment is to find as many of the items on the list as they can. So they're going through the store and you'll see it's a pretty, pretty big store. It's about 18,000 square feet. So it's like a nice small grocery store. 
and we have a wide variety of products. We're, we're currently up to over 400 individual um, unique labels uh, and all close to 500 objects that you can select. So they're going through the virtual environment and they're trying to find ho-hos because that's one of the items on the list. I didn't say that this was a good list for people to shop for. I'm just saying it was a list that we put together to see how people interact with the environment and get some feedback. So they're in the proper aisle and they're looking, oh, that's not quite right. So they're looking at the different options. So they have to scan all these different boxes to find out, okay, which one is the one that's exactly on the list. And they're just about ready to get it. They're looking through this. Notice that there's these boxes in the way. There's this uh, you know, ladder in the way. So we're trying to simulate some things that kind of interfere with your ability to perform the task. And do these contribute to a sense of, oh, it's, it, it's more challenging versus an environment where there's nothing, it's just you know, clear, there's no, no, dis there's no distractions, there's no things blocking your way. Um, very just standard audio that you would hear in a store. Um, next slide, please. Now, uh, in this slide, you're gonna, is this the same one? I think it, yeah, this one, okay. So what other things that we can do, um, and this is a short video, this shows what happens to the person when they get a text message. You're not gonna be able to hear it, but the text will actually be beeping and beeping and beeping until they respond to it. So it's that shopping trip where you're at the store and your loved one keeps saying, hey, could you get this? Or, hey, don't get this, don't get that. So how do these factor into your experience? And you, you can see here on the cell phone, they said, don't forget the cereal. So it's one of those uh, reminders that, you know, distracts you momentarily. So maybe you're on your way to get pick something up and then you get this and how does that influence? Next slide, please. So one thing that makes us unique is that we do our development in-house. Uh, as Patty said earlier, we have an engineering staff, we have graphic design, which is uh, unique in that, um, you know, we have the capacity to build our environments the way we want them rather than hiring outside firm, which has pros and cons to it. Um, and play this, uh, this is another short video, uh, and it shows us working in our lab. This is our lab over in uh, building 10. And what we do is we, you know, first test out our software in different stages. And I think we're up to 70 different versions of the grocery store at this point that we've been trying out over the past year. And uh, it is a uh, time consuming process because everything has to be made from the ground up. Next slide, please. So then from there, we implement or engage uh, with participants. And we're about ready to start our first uh, study and it, we will be in our clinic up in outpatient nine. And this is what it looks like. So we have a similar setup, but it's in uh, kind of a familiar clinic setting and we can evaluate how people respond to the virtual environment just about anywhere, anywhere we have space. So we set it up in this small room and everything works great. And this kind of gives you an example of how we monitor the person while they're in the environment. So we can keep track of what they're doing. We can monitor their behaviors to see if they're making any mistakes, which might have to do with the software or just with normal variations. Uh, next slide, please. So one of our first questions is, is virtual reality even an appropriate tool? Is it useful for studying cognitive fatigue? Because you know VR in and of itself is so visually rich and um, a lot of stimulation. Maybe it's just being in the VR environment itself that can cause fatigue. So we need to evaluate, you know, what are we actually measuring here? So in our first study, um, not only are we looking at, you know, how do people experience the environment, but we're looking at some factors that would contribute to not, not the, the VR maybe not being the most appropriate. So if people have a lot of eye strain or maybe they get headaches or things like that. So we really need to be careful when we design our studies that we don't confound what we're looking at um, just by some artifact of technology. The other thing we wanna know is, is grocery shopping, it's, it's a very common activity of daily, instrumental activity of daily living. Does it induce subjective feelings of cognitive fatigue? And we need to do that 
by comparing to just being in the store environment and comparing that to having a task. And in the task, you have to go through a shopping list. So one, you have a new store environment, although it's set up like many stores. So there's a learning element. So we know learning can cause fatigue. There's a strong attentional component. You have to do a lot of visual scanning and paying attention. Uh, there's a lot of um, remembering like, oh, is this the item I'm supposed to get or not supposed to get? And there's a learning of the interface. So we're wondering, you know, is there something about shopping that could cause fatigue? And this is to differentiate it from other research paradigms that use um, just the laboratory test. So you have to sit there and pay attention to, you know, a circle on the screen and press the button every, you know, every half second or something. Those things to only translate really to activities like driving or if you're, you know, uh, a worker who has to pay attention to a screen for a uh, long period of time, like monitoring CCTVs or things like that. And we also want to know if, if we make the environment more challenging, what is the impact on fatigue? And, and, and not just self-reporting, the experience of, you know, oh, yes, I feel tired and that, but also objective. Can we object, objectively observe these factors such as do they make more mistakes as they get fatigued? Do people change their eye tracking? Um, you know, do they have to recheck their cart? Oh, did I get the right thing? Do they have to recheck their list all the time or do they have it memorized? Do they have to you know, check out the signage or did they learn where they were supposed to go? And we can track not only through eye tracking but through their movement, we should see a more efficient um, one, efficient way of going through the list, two, a more efficient way of going through the store, and three, if they're not sure where they're at, do they use the signage well? So these are all things that we look for that are below the level of consciousness. So people may not be able to report to you, yeah, I was feeling tired, but their performance might change that make you question whether or not uh, they were as efficient as they were um, previously. So we really wanna find out if VR is really a useful tool for studying these individual differences. And instead of being in a, you know, a kind of a laboratory psychological task, we wanna observe it in a more naturalistic way to understand better how people experience this day to day rather than just you know, in a lab. Next slide, please. And so one of the ways that we can track um, Fatigue is through self-report, and we've developed a way of doing it in the actual environment. So you can see on the screen that while they're in the environment, we can ask them different questions and they can respond just like they would to any other digital uh, interface. And these are two tasks that we will be using. One is the, a version of the VFAS, which has been used in MRI research. So you can do it within the scanner. You can also do it within the VR much more easily than you could uh, other types of VFAS. Uh, and we're also doing a workload. And the workload scale is essentially how hard did you have to work in order to perform the task? If some people are really good at shopping and they find that, you know, they're, you know, this is a really a easy task for them, we wouldn't expect them to be fatigued. But someone who maybe is a little more challenged in this area, they might be more, more fatigued uh, and report more workload. So we want to understand what is the relationship between workload and fatigue. Uh, to better understand individual differences. Next slide, please. Other things that we can do is visualize learning and movement. So this is a couple of graphs that were created from a movement study we did uh, in, our, in the AVB um, almost a year ago. And it was a simple, someone walking through a pattern. And what we found is that, you know, when you first learn a pattern that you walk through space, you're much more hesitant, you're, you make big, bigger jumps and you get bigger gaps in your velocity. So we can check people's velocity. How quickly are they moving from one point to another? That means they're improving or learning or being better at navigating that space. We can look at their changes in acceleration. Okay, when they have something they're gonna search for in the store, do they kind of like, okay, I'm gonna speed up and I know I'm gonna get over to you know the frozen food as quickly as I can. Uh, and having been in the in the virtual store uh, a, a lot of times, you do get pretty quick at finding your way around once you know where things are at. So you can measure uh, as the person goes through the environment, learning in a way that's very 
unobtrusive and they don't even, people won't even realize it's happening. Last, next slide, please. So where are we at now? Uh, we're really uh, gonna start our user experience uh, study within the week. We just need to get some, a few fi final details uh, cleared up. And um, in the user experience study, we're really testing to make sure that everyone can use the, the software it, and it's inclusive. There's nobody who you know, struggles with it because of any uh, characteristic of being older or younger or whatever it happens to be. Um, but prior to that, there's something called beta testing. And beta testing is simply, you know, are there any bugs in the system? You know, are there, could we improve the way people make selections or interact with the environment or move? And what we found is that something very intuitive, which is you point the wand as a trigger, you uh, and pull the trigger, uh, is actually harder to use in the virtual space than one would think. So we changed that. Um, uh, front to a different type of interaction and it's way better. We changed our phone scrolling uh, because we realized that Apple and iOS, I mean, iOS devices versus Android devices scroll differently and people were getting confused. So we had to figure out a better way to scroll. Um, we also found that different store brands in the store because we're essentially grabbing items off the shelf, scanning them and put them in the store um, can cause a little bit of break in the realism, not too much, uh, but we figured out a way to handle that. And people had um, some issues navigating the environment when they don't have um, a directional stream that shows, okay, you're gonna move from this spot to this spot. It's totally unnatural. You never see that in real life. You don't see a, you know, a, a green arrow that shows you where you're going. But sometimes you have to sacrifice realism in order to get the correct uh, way of navigating through the environment. People are, are really like the store. They think it's really realistic. Um, we've we've been identified a few bugs. You know, somebody jumps around and they end up in the fish tank. You know, that's that's a lot of fun, but it's not very realistic. Um, and some people were reporting some legibility issues. So we're hoping uh, we made some modifications to the program to improve that. Next slide. So. Where are we at in, in terms of where we're going? Um, we are next looking at home medication management. We're gonna look at different environments that people may be using in order to manage their medication or sort their pills or understand how they're able to translate information from a pill label into an actual behavior, which is sorting them into a pill box. And we can do that with all sorts of environmental controls and chaos if we want. Uh, we're also using the All of Us data uh, which is, uh, you know, our focus on, on data sets and common data elements uh, is another part of the lab related to informatics. Uh, and we're also looking for a collaboration. We've had a number of institutes that are very interested in our virtual shopping, particularly the cognitive fatigue. So we anticipate um, many future studies throughout, um, throughout NIH. And that's where we are. Oh, you're muted, Patty. Uh, thanks very much to Jim. And I want to thank Shannon and the NINR uh, intramural program because this project really is, has been supported and enthusiastically embraced. And now we have a couple of minutes to answer your questions. Perfect. Thank you so much. And I've asked Dr. Peter Lewin to lead the council discussion. Um, Peter, are you yes, there? Thank you very much. It's an absolutely fascinating talk especially with my engineering background. Mm -hmm. So, um, I, and I think it's, it's a wonderful idea. Uh, let me just ask you a couple of questions. So you make an assumption that your population is familiar with the technology. Uh, that's one thing which I would like you to, to comment upon. And the other one is, what would you do if you have a slightly different task? So the task is that you have a patient who was treated in a hospital and now he or she is at home and uh, they need to follow up things like certainly taking medicine or maybe having some therapeutic treatment of let's say chronic ulcers. What would you do in a situation like that? 
So let me uh, take ask Jim to comment first on the issue of familiarity of we, with VR and how are we going to handle that in our studies? And then I'll address the issue of what kinds of tasks can we study and what can't we study? Jim? So the first um, part of our, our first phase of our research is exactly to get at that point. It's our user experience study where we are targeting a broad range of individuals to make sure that they can use the technology. Now, if we find that there are you know, some barriers to the technology, then we will make adjustments to how they interact with the environment. And in fact, the changes that we've made so far are I think gonna help dramatically because it's really button clicking and point and what it comes down to is you look like you're in a shopping, in a store, you point at something and you pull a trigger and it's right in front of you. Now, the hard part will be that there is, you know, a learning curve. Uh, and so we have a training, a shopping training. So before anyone goes in to do the actual task, we do train them how to use it. And our goal really with this user experience study is to, to make sure that we haven't done anything in the technology or that the technology maybe is just too challenging because you are manipulating these two these two wands in your hands and there's some coordination there that some groups of individuals may find, oh, this is either too challenging or they don't understand it or we need to you know, improve the way we communicate uh, how to use that. One thing I'm not sure you saw though is that um, on, on the controllers, if you hold them up, it actually has a menu on them that reminds you. It says, okay, this is push this one or push this one. So at any point in time, someone's like, I don't know what to do. They can just lift their hand up and they can see, oh, okay, this is how I select, this is how I move. So that that's why we don't just jump into research. We always do a lot of beta testing and we always do a lot of user experience. Uh, thanks, Jim. So the, the, the question is, is really an important one and, and we recognize as many things, visual acuity, dexterity and other factors. Um, we may find that this technology as a, as, an, as a investigational tool is useful only for certain age groups. Right now, there's very little indication that there's any restriction by age. Some indication about um, psychomotor skills, particularly dexterity, <coughs> excuse me, and visual acuity. Um, let me talk to you about the second thing. What can and can't we do? Immersive VR is not good when you need to be able to see your hands because you can't see your hands in immersive VR. So any task that requires fine motor skill where you need to manipulate something with hands that you see won't be able to be studied there. However, if you think about our concept of micro behaviors, you can break down the activities that one needs to do for self-care and self-management to a certain set to lead up to where an individual needs to have a shift in the me this medium of study. So for example, we could do an immersive VR study replicating your house while you collect all the materials that you need to treat the ulcers and then remove the technology and actually do a physical study of your manipulation of the materials to do the treatment. And excuse me, we've been talking a little bit about how portable the equipment could be. So could we move this to someone's house to conduct a study just like that one that would be suggested there? I totally agree with that. I still think it's a fascinating idea. The, the thing which, which I would like to see included is how would you ensure that the patient which is using equipment at home is using it in a safe way and is not doing anything wrong? And you have a variety of patients, they may be aging, they may be suffering from, got a bit early Alzheimer or some other kind of dementia and um, their behavior may be unpredictable. I thank you very much for that. I'm, I'm smiling a little bit and I'm, I'm gonna disclose something. Some of you may or may not know that Shirley Moore and I worked together a longer time ago than either of us wants to admit, but this question has persisted across my research. What if people use the technology wrong? And, and that, that is, is critical for nurses to think about, but we have always thought about it. What if someone leaves their, their syringes out in their home? What if a dressing change isn't disposed of properly? So we have a new area to think of. 
Um, Shirley, do you want to comment on how we how we thought about that 30 years ago? And is there new ideas we could have? Because you've done other work in your own area. I don't know how, if I have any new um, ideas. I would think our goal was kind of just systematically collect those those situations uh, and then, you know, think that we're going to systematically then learn how to deal with them better. Um, but, um, you know, what's the safety first? Okay. Yeah. And then you work kind of your way down the, the hierarchy of needs, but um, we would collect them and then think safety first and, and then problem solve it in that way. This is why an interdisciplinary team is really necessary. And by the way, I want to reassure all of you, I am not the nurse on the team. Denise Goldsmith, who is a uh, advanced practice nurse from the Boston area, brings us nursing content. And we had hoped to bring on a wonderful postdoc from, uh, from Australia who was not able to join us because of the quarantine. But we will always have people who know nursing a lot better than I do. Look, and just, I, okay. I'm, I'm totally in a great support of that. Without nurses, we would be lost with all those devices. And uh, just quickly, um, for this study, the person is seated the whole time. There's always two people there to help them. So yeah. we were thinking safety all the time. And as far as uh, cognitive impairment, there's actually been a few studies showing that patients with early Alzheimer's can do these virtual environments. Also individuals with traumatic brain injury have done uh, shopping environments and even individuals with epilepsy. Mm -hmm. So there is some, at least some previous uh, research that shows they can manage these environments. Okay, I don't want to monopolize discussion. So I would really, be very, very pleased if others will chip in and uh, or chime in and say a word. Well, thanks for your great presentation, Dr. Brennan. Uh, it's very nice to see you here. Uh, I have a very practical question. Uh, actually, I tried to develop a VR intervention for my own research, but the cost to develop the intervention was so high. So I just, I mean, almost gave up. So any suggestion for uh, uh, future researchers who have uh, great ideas uh, about a uh, VR intervention? Thanks very much. Um, the, the cost to develop the, this intervention at uh, NINR was probably 20% of the cost to develop the interventions we did in Wisconsin because of the nature of the technology. So the technology is much less expensive. What we've learned through this process and, uh, is that the, the creating the environment is, is really where, where a, a, a significant, but not a, not a disproportionate amount of the cost comes in, but bringing creative nursing thinking into what has to happen in the environment, what are the critical factors is also a cost we cannot ignore. Um, we use the Unity platform so we don't have to build a lot of our basic data collection and data visualization tools. It it's not completely seamless. We have a engineer, Ross Tradinik, who's on the phone right now. Um, also a graphic artist, um, Caitlin uh, Snell is here with us. Uh, Donnie Bliss is not here with us, but he's been another part of our graphics team. So it's, it is expensive to bring the right team together. And Jim um, brings a nice defense that says growing it internally is actually ultimately less expensive because you have some control over the product and you have some ability to modify it. Where I think will happen in the future, and I don't think I'm gonna see this in my career, but I think within five years, we will have platforms that are actually more interoperable, much the same way as you, when you, you think about other practices in nursing where we can change the, the, the nature of the content, but use the same delivery mechanism. We hope to also inform better what kinds of data are relevant to collect. So in Wisconsin, we used to collect moment by moment data every, every twitch that a person made. Now we collect, as you saw here, some of the performance of acceleration and velocity, but not every single point in space. And in time, uh, we hope to be able to refine measurement in this area. That's why Jim's recruiting Jim to this team has been so important for us. Thank you. All right, any other questions? If not, I would hand over my honor of uh, facilitating the 
the questions and answers to the to Dr. Old. Okay, thank you so much. And thank you, Dr. Brennan and, and Jim for, for joining us today at uh, the council meeting. Quite fun stuff um, and very, very interactive and interesting. Um, Leave. Dr. Old, I'd like to also just get, thank the rest of our team, most of whom are on, on the line here, but we also have uh, LaRonda, our, our administrative assistant, and um, Alex, who's our, one of our new um, post-baccalaureate students is going to be with us for the summer. We have a very strong commitment to research and training, so I'm going to leave all of you with an assignment, which is to please talk about our work with others to help us be able to recruit really strong pre- and postdoctoral trainees in this. Nursing needs innovation and ways that people can think about new technologies as both research and interventional platforms. Thanks very much. Yes, so true. Thank you so much. So we are coming close to the end of the open session. Um, are there um, any comments anyone would like to make? Any additional questions that people have for Dr. Zank or myself or, or each other? Um, before we go on to closed session. It's been a, it's been a very intensive uh, council meeting, I think. Um, all right. So we haven't had much of a break today. Um, officially, we have till uh, start closed session at 3.30. Would you like a little bit longer break? Or would you like to jump right into closed session? Nobody brave enough to say anything. Jump right in. Jump right in. OK. So we will start at 3.30 with closed right. session. I'll hand it uh, back to Dr. Zank to close out open session. Hey, um, thanks everybody for your all your participation today. Um, so open session uh, is now ended at 317 Eastern. Uh, council members, please join for the closed session um, again at 330 Eastern. So see you in a bit. Thanks everyone.